Do we have any citizen statements or petitions? See hands up. I don't believe we have any correspondence to the board. So let's uh, skip over town hall update for now. Item six, consider reappointment the Democratic Registrar Ellen Pond. Do I have a motion? So moved. Term to expire at 331.26. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Right. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd ask uh, Zach Blake, Division of Local Services, Department of Revenue, and, and Chris, his counterpart, to come up. And they're going to give a presentation for a long anticipated financial review they've been working on for several months. I'm meeting to first. Sure. The uh, meeting at 6.31 p.m. As I said, welcome to Zach Blake and Chris Wilcock from the Division of Local Services. Yeah, great. Hey, thank you guys. For, thank you. Thanks for doing this. I go through it. This is a great, extensive report, and I appreciate you guys doing it. Thanks so much. Thank you. I know we just we discussed this, been discussing this for a couple, like at least a couple of years. So it was good to have you finally get us in the queue, and and I know you met with an awful lot of people, spent an awful lot of time, and. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your recommendations and uh, tonight we're going to hear your report and uh, we're not really going to take any action on it tonight. This is really for us all to, to hear it and understand it. And then as the weeks and months go on, we'll break this up to the individual departments and people that need to take action to implement this plan. And I have you on my cell phone, so we'll be calling you, I'm sure, quite a bit. Happy to. <laughs> that maybe you can. Take us through your report. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for inviting us, members of the board. I uh, appreciate you having us out this evening. I've got a short uh, slide deck to uh, to run through. Uh, just as far as an agenda, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background and for the members of the public as well as to who is the Division of Local Services. Uh, more importantly, who is the Financial Management Resource Bureau that you invited in to conduct this financial management review? And then going to go into uh, a little bit of the scope of the work we do. I'm going to give you a, a brief little snapshot of the community from uh, the work that we did. I will outline sort of what a financial management review involves. And then uh, we will go through. I chunked up the recommendations. And so, um, you know, I don't, you know, in my experience doing this in, in hundreds of different communities, I find that it's it's easier not rather than going through every single recommendation to sort of put them through in, in chunks. And so, but I, I welcome any and all questions at the end related to any of the recommendations. Um, you know, we're here on your time, so um, we're happy to answer those questions. But if I don't know if there's somebody who can advance the slides. That would be yeah, yeah. fantastic. We're all over. <laughs> Give you the signal. So we're we're good with the agenda slide. We can jump ahead. So just uh, you know, some background on who we are as the division of local services. Um, so we are a uh, state regulatory agency uh, that Chris and I work for. Just as a uh, a little bit of a background. Um, I am the chief of the Financial Management Re uh, Resource Bureau, where I have worked for oh, just over the last 15 years. Prior to that, I worked in a community in Massachusetts, um, started out in, in human resources, then went more into facilities management before jumping over to the division where I head up the Financial Management Resource Bureau. The uh, in 
Chris, I can let you introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, Chris Wilcock, Bureau of Local Assessment. Uh, we support, you know, 351 different municipalities for assessing, uh, providing guidance and, and resources. Uh, we have about two and a half million parcels across the state. So um, just a lot of information. Uh, before I came to DLS, I was uh, uh, an assessor for two decades um, in four or five different communities uh, around the Commonwealth. Um, I have practical as well as policy um, experience and um, you know, a lot of this report is stuff that I dealt with day to day. So uh, as a subject matter expert on local assessment, a lot of those, um, as Zach uh, said, chunks ask me any specific, you know, nuts and bolts questions about those, uh, not only the policy side, but the practical side. And uh, again, just being here to answer your specific questions on any of the assessing operations is, is my intent. So uh, thanks for having us here tonight. Thanks, Chris. And as, as Chris alluded to, we're so we're a division made up of, of five different bureaus. Um, I'm not going to go through every bullet on the on the slide, but there's really two uh, primary regulatory functions we provide. One is the fairness and equity of local property taxes, which uh, Chris heads up. There's also the Bureau of Accounts, which is responsible if you're familiar with the tax recap sheet and getting your tax rate certified, as well as the certification of your free cash every year. So that's through the Bureau of Accounts. We're also responsible for distributing uh, local aid to cities and towns. Um, we also have an IT unit that's responsible for a lot of the data visualizations uh, in the website. So if you haven't uh, recently, I would absolutely encourage you to go on to our website or training resource center. There's a tremendous amount of information there, videos, other content and data to mine uh, to learn more about local government uh, in sort of broad context, but as also at a very detailed uh, sort of technical level. And then there's a tremendous amount of information that you can use to benchmark your community against other communities. And that's all data that we're pulling directly from you when you submit information to us. And then uh, I head up the Financial Management Resource Bureau for about the past 30 years or so, uh, we've been a bureau that really provides consulting related services to cities. And I pull um, my team is a field of ex experts in accounting, treasury collections, assessing. Um, they've served in roles like finance directors, treasurer collectors. Uh, you know, I came from a facilities background. Um, but collectively, we also uh, volunteer in our communities. You know, I myself serve on a number of different boards and committees in my own town, but um, many members of my team do as well. So we bring that breadth of experience in the work that we do in cities and towns across the Commonwealth. Altogether, uh, I sort of stopped counting after about 250, but I've been north of 300 communities across the Massachusetts, uh, along with my team. And so we were bringing that collective experience and expertise that we found in what works, what doesn't work at a very practical level. We're not trying to be academic here. This is not about being ivory tower. This is what, what how can we right size our recommendations for a community like Menden? Because we know Menden, uh, as much as there's 351 communities and there's a lot of similarities, there's a uniqueness too. And so we want to make sure that we're fitting these recommendations in sort of the context of the community that's there. And, and just so you have a sort of a sampling of the work that we do. Yeah, on the financial management re review that I'll jump into, we provide financial forecasts, capital plans, financial policies. We analyze really anything related to financial management in cities and towns. So if there's a particular challenge that a community is facing, we're called in at no cost. This was a free service to the community uh, to provide our expertise and analysis and, and deliver a report. Uh, next slide. So what do our um, financial management uh, reviews focus on? So they're they're based on on-site visits and interviews that we have uh, with local officials. So um, we were blessed with the opportunity to interview, I think most everyone that touches the financial management aspect of this town had the opportunity to meet individually with each of you uh, remotely over the phone or in person. Uh, and just get that sort of collective wisdom of the roles and responsibilities that folks have in town and how what processes and procedures are there and how people are getting their work done. Together, there's a tremendous amount of information that we're gathering. I have about a you know eight inch binder worth of data and information that I gather from the community. 
all the way from bylaws to everything that you submit to us through the state, as well as credit rating reports, debt schedules, reconciliations. Um, and, and we use that collective information to really guide where our recommendations are, what are the challenges that this community is facing to develop our report. And, and our report really focuses on sort of four primary categories. One is the overall government structure uh, in the context of duties and responsibilities of local officials. We're looking at your forecasting, capital planning, um, and budget process in general, and how efficient and effective that is. We're looking at the degree of coordination and communication that goes between and among local officials, boards, and committees. So, for example, how well is the finance committee and the select board communicating? How well is the treasurer collector communicating with the accountant, with the assessors, et cetera? And then it's really a measure of the general efficiency and effectiveness of local government operations and making sure that this community is maximizing whatever limited resources uh, are available because every community is under similar pressure like that. Next slide. So just jumping into, um, you know, then a little bit here, um, you know, we have a, obviously a vibrant residential community, has a great rural character. There's a rich history out there. Um, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure for me. It's one of the fun parts of the job is I always uh, give myself uh, a good buffer to come drive around the community. I'm a visual learner type of a person, so I like to explore, get to know the community, uh, see what makes it tick. Um, as part of that, too, I also try to take advantage, and I was lucky enough to do that to tour the police department, the highway barn, things like that. Uh, Town Hall, which was getting renovated, and so it's exciting to see that. Um, but it really gives me sort of a sense and a flavor of, of what kind of investment are, are residents making in their community. Um, you know, this is a town of uh, you know, 6,200 residents. I threw in the state median there just, uh, you know, uh, so you can sort of benchmark yourself against the state. So a little bit smaller than the average community across Massachusetts, uh, $25 million total operating budget, and a little smaller than the state average. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, $7,700 average single family tax bill, a little bit north of the state average, but I think that's, I think that's really, um, you know, part of the fact that, uh, you know, this tends to be a, a uh, wealthier demographic community, and so there's a higher tax bill. There's a more willingness to invest in services and uh, education. Uh, uh, government structure, five member board of selectmen, as you all know, uh, town administrator, open town government, open town meeting government, regional school district. You know, these are things that I mentioned because, um, you know, well, there's a lot of communities that function that way. It also makes and unique uh, in its own right. And you uh, are lucky enough with a AA plus rating by S&P. Um, that's a really solid rating for a community like this. And um, you, know, you should be proud of that in, in terms of the financial management aspects. Some of the highlights and and I hate using me, just would you prefer to hold all questions till the end or if there's questions as we get? Uh, I mean, I think I'd rather have them at the end if. if no, I, I can bring it back, so that's fine. Yeah, OK. Um, so I've got, uh, you know, a series of highlights here and, and there are obviously challenges. I don't like to look at them as challenges. These are opportunities for this community. Um, this is a town that's uh, been lucky enough to bring on a finance director, treasurer, collector position. You have an HR position here. You've moved from an elected to appointed highway surveyor. You're reimagining how you're providing services. Um, you know, this is a community where there's an uh, you know, 83% of your budget is reliant on the tax levy and 90% of that burden falls to residents. So this is a community that has, you know, every year it's a tight budget and that's not unusual to communities across Massachusetts. They're constantly under that type of pressure, but, um, you know, there are competing service and capital demands and those are challenges that the community, especially Menden, are, are dealing with. And then there's need for greater long-term planning. So when we look at forecasting capital planning, uh, financial policies, you know, those are things that we want to start to see get baked into how this community manages itself. Um, and then one of the other uh, challenges you've had, there's been some turnover within the finance offices, and so you're, you're starting to really sort of solidify what that management of that operation looks uh, like. And there's uh, some potential for turnover in some other offices too, and so it's always important that there be succession planning 
uh, around how to rethink, reform uh, the competent operations that you've had going forward, knowing that we're in a very uh, tight type of job market for local officials. It's not easy to find talent right now. It tends to be very expensive. They don't have the skill sets that, unfortunately, we've sort of been blessed with uh, for a long time. And so I think it's important that this community is coming together to sort of rethink how do we make this work with uh, the kind of limited budget that we have. Uh, next slide. So the, the report itself, um, and that should count how many pages it was. Uh, 26 pages. So it begins uh, with an introduction that really just outlines the scope of the report and jumps into a community profile, outlines uh, you know, a brief description of the community, talks about the administrative structure, the op financial management operations, and then gives a little bit of a description of the uh, financial condition of the town. And then we jump into the, the recommendations themselves. And I've categorized them in two sort of areas. One is sort of structural roles and responsibilities, and then the other one is on long-term financial planning. And as I point out on the slide, there's 18 total recommendations. So like I said, I'm not going to go through every single recommendation uh, in, in any kind of a detail, but I did want to jump in uh, and sort of, sort of these two areas and, and where I think um, you know, it'd be good to start to build out what a blueprint looks like for a community like Menden. So, you know, right now you're operating with a town administrator um, whose responsibilities are outlined in job description. And in a lot of communities, we look for uh, those responsibilities to be more codified. And so what we're suggesting is that you do that through a bylaw that really defines and formalizes the roles and responsibilities of that office. Um, it details the hiring, removal, um, how you evaluate measure performance. These are all really core critical issues that um, shouldn't be left from year to year as to, you know, how are we going to decide to do this? This should be systemized in a lot of ways. Um, and then understanding you know, what level of authority we want to give this person over the budget process, over contract negotiations, over procurement. And so these are all decisions that we think it makes sense rather than the board uh, delegating these or outlining this through job description that you really come together and formalize these responsibilities so that they're codified in bylaw so that they uh, live beyond sort of the year in which you're functioning, but uh, are more um you know permanent in nature similarly with the the uh finance director treasurer collector you have a, a position there where you've combined your treasurer collector and now that person has additional finance related responsibilities as finance director however the reality is, is that person's really functioning as a treasurer collector and so what we would like to see is sort of uh, uh you know a renewed look at what responsibilities that person is taking on, making sure that they're coordinating the financial management activities of the community, that they're involved in the forecasting, capital planning, and, and budget process. This is really a position where we would see as the quarterback of the financial management aspect of, of local government. And so we would want to see that more formalized. Again, this is a role that we would typically see in bylaw or town charter. Um, you know, develop a succession plan for the principal assessor. You know, that's an operation that has worked seamlessly for years uh, and to the great success of Menden. Um, but, you know, at some point there's always turnover in these departments and you want to limit the amount of risks that is out there because we're, we are truly, especially when it comes to uh, assessors and, and Chris can sort of speak more to this at the end, that the breadth and technical expertise that's required to do that job is not something you just pull off the street. Um, and the to find and replicate the model that you have today is becoming more and more expensive. And so what we're looking for is just to, to start to strategize now while you have those people in place about what that office would look like and how it's going to retain the high success rate that it has now um, and so it's really just highlighting that uh, that risk that's out there um, last two you know really it's about um, 
similarly with the the town administrator and the finance director you know you're you're you have sort of a, a an operating model where you're sort of functioning like a consolidated finance department but again it's not formalized in any way and so we would be looking for you to formalize that relationship to really have a hierarchy where you have a finance director then a, you know, obviously combined with the treasurer collector but also assessor and accounting position this is uh, becoming much much more common in communities uh, of this size um, because it sort of consolidates those responsibilities. Uh, it takes away the sort of a silo approach to financial management uh, and again brings together that sort of quarterbacking position that can really make sure that all of these functions are working seamlessly together uh, to the success of, of Menden. And then last, and, and really what this encompasses, the entire sort of structure, roles, and responsibilities, is we think it's important to pull in a cross-section of people from the community to form a government study committee. And that committee would largely, you know, start off with this report as a blueprint to understand, you know, are these things that Menden wants to move in this direction? Does it value this? And how do we codify that? And, and what we would look for is not only a review of the town bylaws, which we think periodic review there always makes sense, you know, generally once a decade, um, but also whether or not Menden's in a stage now where it is ready for a town charter. Uh, town charter is, is sort of the town's constitution really it really lays out the structure of operations the distribution of power those lines of authority um and so that it's not left up to sort of the whim or or you know annual decisions by whoever might be the chair for example um so that's the uh structure roles and responsibilities just jumping into the long-term financial planning you know this is uh in a lot of ways, um, you know, one of the core reasons I think we were invited in here, right? So um, I'd be remiss if I did not include our diagram that we include in just about everything. I feel like I need that T-shirt made up with this thing, but really, this is this is how we sort of define uh, success in communities: is the um, financial planning around uh, defined financial policies. Uh, having a uh, um, consistent uh, and clearly defined uh, capital plan and uh, financial forecast. And so just jumping through these recommendations, it all starts with having a vision, goals and objectives for this community. And so we think it's important that the select board you know, once a year, start of the fiscal year, sometime August, September, you sit down and you decide as a group collectively, what are our goals for this community? What do we want to achieve this year? And I always look at goals as sort of two part. There's really sort of the policy goals that you all have as elected officials of this community. There might be a particular issue that you ran on that you think is of value to the community that you think should be a goal, but there's also sort of structural goals that come through the organization, right? These are goals that individual departments have that feed up to the town administrator. And so we would see a sort of a collection of goals and objectives, both from a policy perspective, but also an administrative framework. And that really starts to set up the success of what is this community vision and what does it want to achieve that year? And then equally important, how do we measure that success at the end to make sure that we are achieving these goals? Next, uh, we talk about developing a financial plan. That's really that collection of the financial policies. Every community should have rigorous, defined financial policies. There shouldn't be a dollar that's not spent that hasn't been measured against a policy that's been developed, whether it's stabilization, free cash, debt. Um, it really makes the process more simple when you've had this sort of collective uh, meeting around what it is that we want our objectives to be in those types of different areas rather than fight on, uh, you know, Town meeting floor, for example, um, you know, in this this really promotes just sound, consistent, effective financial management. Um, the other part of this is having a robust capital improvement plan. You know, the point there is really to mitigate risk, right? 
equipment ages, buildings age, things fall apart. Deferred maintenance is a huge problem in communities across Massachusetts. And so, you know, a lot of communities will develop 5, 10, 15, 30 year capital plans, depending on the um, size and scope of uh, the buildings and equipment they have. And this is really about establishing consistent standards and setting up what those spending priorities are for the community. And then last within the, the financial plan is uh, a long range forecast. You, you don't know where you're going if you haven't sort of mapped out the road. And so Massachusetts, we're, we're a little bit blessed in that we don't have uh, a really exotic revenue streams that come in. Uh, and so it's really easy for us to predict what our revenues will look like over the course of time, especially over a three year period. Um, you measure that against your expenses it's never going to look good after year one. Uh, every community is virtually in the red because when you have the inflation of expenses growing at five, seven percent, your revenues are at three, five percent, there's always going to have be a mismatch and decisions that are going to have to be weighed as to what gets funded and what gets off the table. But when you have a financial forecast, it's easier to evaluate those choices. Um, it's it it makes decisions around wage and collective bargaining simpler and it may mapping out things like capital planning easier to know that in x year we'll have available funds to support whatever equipment uh, or building uh, renovation might be necessary the next recommendation is is sort of a new one for me but i've had some success in in other communities i've entered my community uh, to hold quarterly financial briefings. And this is really centered for me on education. One of the things that I find with uh, particularly select boards and in finance committees is it's rare that they come together as a group to really delve into the financial management um, and the uh, sort of understanding how do we monitor our community's fiscal uh, health where are we being successful? Where are there challenges and opportunities that we should look at? And so we think on a quarterly basis, you know, a presentation by the town ministry or finance director on where we stand on our budget, uh, you know, revenues to date against expenses, but also, you know, what is our reserve to look like? What does our debt picture look like? Are there areas for concern? Um, and I think that's something that you can pivot mid year to address these things. Uh, when you're aware of it, and so it's really an educational tool there. And then last is part of this group of recommendations. You know, we always think it's important, especially with the level of turnover that's happened here, you yeah. document those roles and responsibilities. There's new technology that's here. There's new processes that get put in place. You don't have a real deep staff. And so if any one person were to leave, it's really nice to have a cookbook to go to to say here's the recipe to get payroll out to make sure invoices get paid um, rather than having somebody to reinvent that uh, when they come on board and so we think it's important to do that that is not an easy process to go through i've done that uh, when i was in my community but if you pick at it every day and you say you know i'm gonna go and this is how i put the warrant together and you document that as you're going through and doing it uh, you know over the course of the year you're going to have yourself a procedures manual and we think that adds a lot of value, especially to hand off to sort of that next generation that's going to uh, take on the office. So, so those are the two core areas of recommendations I wanted to cover. Obviously, there are, you know there's 18 recommendations in there, but um, you know I wanted to really delve into the report to the extent that you folks had questions. So I wanted to open up to you. Thank you very much for that. For that summary. Oh, Mike, you got a, you got a question that you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with that. Um, well, actually, the, really the first question I had, do you, you reference peer communities throughout the document? I'm curious if you have any best practices, any communities you could reference against these recommendations we could reach out to, have discussions with? I mean, I'm happy to put together the list of peer communities okay. that I always benchmark from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those, so you're suggesting some structural changes for our town government. If you know of other communities that have gone through these types of changes, I'd love to be able to reach out to them, speak to them, and understand whether they're challenged. Oh, I would wholeheartedly yeah. encourage you to do that. Yeah. I just need to know who they are. 
Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm willing to put that list together. Uh, you know, it's it's really based on uh, budgets, populations, yeah. uh, demographic wealth, uh, but also other things uh, as stupid as it sounds, road mileage, yeah. uh, because that matters when you're talking about DPW. Now, this is a generic peer list that I would benchmark. There are any number of peer lists that you can develop depending on what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a particular function or a particular service, you want to make sure that you tailor that peer list relative to that. So even just an example, different going from creating a town charter. If there is a local municipality that's recently gone through that work, just understand that process, what their, their challenges were, doesn't even have to be a similar up here per se. But you have a number of recommendations where if there's a real life example out there we can actually connect with absolutely you've you got some very specific generic changes in terms of codifying you know job descriptions to bylaws as an example so the whole process those what what did the municipality like what do they find beneficial these would be all things we'd want to know when we make the decision on which which of these we want to execute on Okay, the question of, you know, you're making the recommendations, you're making the presentation in other communities. What's the time frame been for to, to go from this report to actually implementing those recommendations? What, what do you think it should, how long do you think it should take us to, to get this done? So, um, you know, that really varies. So it's, it's, it's hard to define, um, but what I would say is this. Um, you need to develop a plan around how to implement these recommendations. And one, you know, where I've, where I've seen communities be really successful is they pull together a cross-section team from town hall, you know, residents as well, uh, who have a vested interest in this. They, um, they outline what the recommendations are, what resources are necessary, identifying the resources that are necessary to implement those recommendations, who identifying the person who is responsible for implementing that or team of individuals responsible for implementing that recommendation and then developing that timeline. So, you know, some of these recommendations are, I'll say relatively low hanging fruit that we would expect to get done in a fiscal year, but other things can take a decade. Uh, they don't happen overnight. A town implementing a town charter, you know, altogether, that's probably a five, seven year process. Um, and it involves a lot of people, but you need to begin with a blueprint, really. Uh, and so that's what we would recommend. And we have models for you that that I can share. For us, which yeah, is what we talked to about. To outline that. Yeah. Right. When we started. Yeah. Just some, do you provide facilitation resources or project management? When you say that, just. Um, so. I, I wish we had the bandwidth to provide that level, uh, but unfortunately we don't. So, I mean, I asked the question because I've seen where PC is assisting us with master plan implementation, Lonnie, right? So there's a whole framework there for, I mean, I think we probably need to bring these things together because some similarities that you see in this study with the master plans recommending. Absolutely. Um, and with the, you know, with CMRPC, maybe we need to leverage now again, it's not, it, there's a cost associated with it, but right. we look at the outside party to assist the press. Well, just, it's, yeah, this type of change requires really strong facilitation, bring all these parties together. So if somebody who has that skill set's probably something we want to look for, whether it's local or consulted. Yeah, and, and I think it would be a really meaningful investment to do that because it would really um, streamline the process to that degree, yeah. All right, well, I think that's an awful lot for one night. Well, First to digest. Do you have another? Yeah. Oh, I've got, I've got, I got a few, but I okay. can take well, some of these in writing if that makes it easier. Uh, you'll email me. Is that I can email you. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. But I'm just kind of just for. The, we still have ten minutes. Right. Oh, I get that. Well, we're we skipped over your. Over. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any? Because I don't have no. Go right ahead. Because I don't have. No. I took your first one, so I don't know if you have any others. <laughs> Uh, I have some pretty in the weeds questions that might be better suited by with an email. Yeah, I can just I can sure. try weed questions by email. That's what I for, 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 the, for the general for the audience. When you're talking, you do speak a lot about creating new bylaws. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and my question is, so we've got job descriptions and you're suggesting bylaws. My sense is that's more from a stability. So if four turns over, you got that stability. Do you feel that the job descriptions as stated today are adequate? Or do we actually need to look at the job descriptions and you, you know what I mean? So is it just stability for long term or yeah, so, do we so, have some gaps? So I don't know that it's actually um, that I would say it's my responsibility to uh, pass judgment on whether your job okay. description is adequate. You know, it's it's a question of is it adequate for you as the board? This individual is serving as your chief administrative officer. I'm looking at it from is creating that stability. Okay. You know, the board is That's fine. Number. as you describe it. I see things in the job description, so I say to myself, okay. We seem to be on the right track. Yeah. If the focus is stability long term, I understand the focus. I yep. just want to make sure everybody else understands that you may not be as familiar with job descriptions. Yeah. And and to your point about um, other peers, there are a number of communities that have these types of bylaws. I'd be happy to provide uh, Kim, the chairman, with what those bylaws are, so that you have a roadmap. Okay. Great. Okay. Two quick ones. One. What is the unreserved, undesignated fund balance I see on our portal, on our dashboard? What make what comprises that? Uh, which page are you look? No, at? it's not the study. It's your it's your new the visualization. Yeah, I don't know what's on that chart, but it's a big number. So the BOA representative is not at this meeting, and I okay. think that's more of. Uh, I'll put that one in writing, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I wish I I knew it off the top of my head, but in terms of the study, where why what was the thing behind averages versus medians when you put your data together? I, the full page there is actually the average tax bill versus the median. So we we measure things by average tax bills. Yep. I I pulled. Yeah, let me let me handle this. So the way that the reporting comes in for assessment, yep. all the single families together, we right. do not have individual assessments. Okay. So determining whether the median, we we don't. The assessor can do that locally. Right. We didn't have that data set for the whole state. So average is something that we've been working on. At some point, hopefully we have median. It's definitely a better indicator. But I average. understand the when you're presenting them on the same page, one's a median, one's an average, you potentially could draw infer some wrong conclusions. Sure. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um one last question that I thought was the last one. And this has nothing to do with the study. Is there an objective measure? And I'm thinking about school funding right now that DLS uses to for peer communities. Is it is it you know, teacher student ratio is it dollars per student? Do you get any of that? Or is that something I should put in writing? We we do not involve ourselves in what level of funding uh, a town should be contributing for education. Objective measure for comparison purposes, what I'm trying to understand. And school districts? Yeah. I think the DESE site has a bunch of metrics that I would probably use okay. depending on, I would, yeah. Uh, we we don't have all those metrics, but I know Jesse does maintain a bunch of different comparison metrics. I would encourage you do touch on it in your study, though. Mm -hmm. You do go into an enrollment funding, and ours does a crisscross. Yeah. So I was kind of um, that's more water finding its own level when I look at that chart, but I wasn't sure what you were driving towards with that page. So that's why I asked. <clears throat> I'm good. Thank you. And all this right. was a great study. I, this is very informative. So I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Any question? Absolutely. Uh, so aggregating questions in general, do we want to have one email blast over of aggregated questions and anything from this board or the finance committee or to reach out individually? Yeah, I mean, for me, it would be easier if you channel it through the town administrator to the, me, and then I'd be happy to respond to those questions. Yeah. Any other members of either board? Anybody? Yeah, the finance committee members on the uh, and remotely that I know there's a lot to digest. Just in in closing, if I could, Mr. Chairman, yeah. it was an absolute pleasure working with this community. Um, we don't always get the level of cooperation and the information that we seek as part of these reviews. It was easy to do that. Um, and so I just want to pass along the appreciation. Um, you know, I work with local officials every day. They are working extremely hard for this community to make sure it's successful. Public doesn't always recognize that. I see it on a day-to-day -day level. People are invested in making this community successful.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Is there somebody from Congressman's office is on the on the remote? Maybe not yet because it hasn't started, but I want to recognize uh, State Rep. Ryan Murray. Thank you for attending. And uh, at this moment, I'd ask uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick, if you please come up and we'll, a couple of minutes early, we'll go into the BVT budget review. Are you going to share the budget? Not there. So if you've got it. It will be awkward. Yes. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to see you. Good to be budget back. season. I know there's a lot of questions raised about transition of staff, but I'm making my 32nd presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, uh, it's interesting that uh, we work closely with Representative Murray. In fact, uh, his uh, office staff and, and my my folks were in touch uh, earlier this week relative to one many things, and that's not an unusual relative to mental health centers and many other activities. Uh, we work with Ken O'Brien, okay, uh, in his former role here, uh, in his current role in Uxbridge, and also uh, with the Boy Scout activities. Um, and, and certainly work with Kim, right, uh, throughout the year is providing information. I'd like to compliment you on reaching out to the Department of Revenue, taking advantage of the local services and others that are available. Uh, it's a great uh, research technique uh, to, to get an example of what's happening in the other 350 cities and towns, and also to look at yourself. If there's anything we can do to help in that process, I will be glad to assist. I'd like to compliment, say thank you to our local school committee representative, Ed Cray, who's been very active since his election uh, in, our, in our process. So a few things for you. Uh, I trust that you recognize that the governor's numbers just came out last week. Uh, I will give the governor credit for indicating that while it was somewhat later than the previous governor in January distributions, that it was ahead of the timetable, which was today, that it originally was produced. Uh, as we monitored things today, we saw no changes uh, in what the governor put out. We recognize the process is a multi-tier process, as do you, uh, and that it will now go to the legislature to, to see what happens. Uh, we remain optimistic with representatives like the, the one you have, uh, that there will be every effort to enhance and really not reduce uh, or subtract from the plans we have in place. When you have those, I'll walk you through that document. And I'll do my best to describe it for those who are not present. This is a, uh, a preliminary document. It doesn't have the detail that the once the budget is fully put together uh, that we uh, make available to you. Uh, um, certainly wanted to honor your invitation to me to be here tonight. So um, I'll share everything we know. I do think we have numbers that are finalized, okay? Uh, uh, but we will be providing you with more detailed information as it becomes available to us. The first thing is, in typical fashion, our own students have put together, okay, through our multimedia program. Uh, the students do this as kind of portfolios and interesting way to expand. The budget subcommittee is listed on the next page as you turn through it. It's a cross representation of school committee representatives. And then, uh, the uniqueness of the Blackstone Valley Tech Partnership is you have 12 other towns as are on, okay, who share in the expenses responsibilities. Um, and the, so the independent treasurer, as well as the business manager, others are listed here. Moving on, uh, you'll find my standard letter, uh, which summarizes the primary changes for the next fiscal year. And in that letter, I talk about um, help you share in the success of the system. Uh, it, it has continued to receive accolades from the state for remarkable scores and MCAS for completion rates and many other things. Um, while the state of Massachusetts is a 4.2 
percent uh, reduction in students in many areas. School systems have witnessed a substantial reduction in students. Uh, we have 830 applicants for next year alone. So the interest in, in coming to us continues to be robust. We only recruit students from the district. We don't tell seats. Um, as we formulated and negotiated various aspects, the letter talks about we were pleased to see that the health benefit cost went up 2%. We work closely with an insurance broker uh, and certainly benefit from you know, our respectful relationships, uh, wellness techniques, uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, they're referenced here. Uh, the, um, we have negotiated a new uh, transportation contract for five years, so that's a known. Uh, we're currently in the third year of the teacher's contract and we're negotiating a new. So um, we don't have the results of the FY24 first year impact. I do hope, uh, I remain optimistic that the contract will be uh, cost sensitive and reasonable. Uh, we often approach, approach um, the collective bargaining with a goal of everybody being a little unhappy with the, with the ending, okay, from school committee to the teachers association. We recognize the success of the school system is, is directly attributable to the total contributions of our teachers, our aides, and so many others. Um, the letter also makes you aware, just as the local service people just uh, suggested, of the likelihood of making a request of a new bond next year, okay, to improve the facility. Uh, the superintendent is older than the building, but it's pretty close. Uh, so that the, uh, we take, Great care. Uh, I know Mike is among those who was toured. Uh, Lonnie has, is, is another one who was toured. And, uh, and, and other members of, of our finance committee uh, previously have toured. Uh, I'll be glad to extend it toward anyone who wants to see uh, the investment and how we take care of it. Uh, we recognize it's a privilege to have the investment that the public has made. And between the help of our students, custodians, and everybody else, uh, we, we treat it with respect. Nevertheless, it's still 60 years old, and so it, it is um, only fair and prudent to plan on a, uh, a modest bond request to be extended to you next year. No numbers have been offered. We, you have noticed, and Kim certainly has noticed, uh, that we're in the, uh, the FY24 nears the conclusion of the current bond. Okay, two years left. Okay, so it's, all, it's almost done. Uh, the, the, that bond was a $36 million bond 18, 20 years ago. We we financed after uh, 10 years, which we're able to do to secure a much lesser rate. Um, and um, in, it, uh, in any case, it's almost paid off, right? And so um, I'm envisioning a request, something of the magnitude of $18 million. That's very premature to give you a number, but just to say, oh, wait a minute, what are you looking at? not looking at a new school. We're not looking at a 300 or 400 million dollar type change. Okay, that would not be my recommendation. With the, with resources we have, technical and otherwise, construction technology, electrical, HVAC, you name it, that I think we can make um, a reasonable, let's say, enhancements, repairs that best protect the investment you've already made. And so, but nevertheless, that'll go forth. So that's uh, that is not going forth for FY24. It'll go, it's it's a year away, so it's a year notice of the likelihood of a request of that nature. Um, the next page is the budget building process, all right, uh, which shows the multiple multiple process. It's very transparent relative to the way we build our budget and a public hearing, which is scheduled for the 23rd of this month. Okay. Adjustments were made as you did relative to the governor's plan to not to release information for the third week of January, so everything shifted. Uh, we've been in touch with uh, all 13 towns. In most cases, it, it's with a combination of the town administrators uh, who have established professional relationships. They know us, we know them, uh, and also at least the chair of finance committees in most cases. Uh, we provide best guess forecasting to them uh, and uh, do our best to, to avoid any surprises. Okay, moving on. The um, the return on investment, we like to point out that uh, as a vocational technical school, uh, we have a rare opportunity to do things others do not, okay? uh, whether it's uh, 
working with Mr. Tineo and his uh, resources outside with the technology. Our own students can do installations. We can do uh, upgrades. We can do lots of things that others cannot. But that's true of 18 different vocational technical programs. So we, we do our best to make changes and make improvements, not to endanger any students, not to put anybody out of a job, but to uh, maximize the resource and learning opportunities and save money at the same time. We also recognize that a non-vocational technical school would not be able to do that. So we, in fairness, um, and you see a, a summary uh, on the left hand side of the return on investment. You see a simple uh, comment from the town administrator in um, in Oxbridge, who I believe is the longest term uh, serving town administrator uh, now that others have retired or moved on. Uh, and so he's it's an example of working with Kim's colleague there. Moving on, if you see the all inclusive one time request. To see we are not a town department. OK, uh, we have no ability to pass on other expenses as, as town department might be able to do. We're not jealous of that. We just distinguish it from the way we do it. Our package we've in my 32 years, we've made one request. We've never changed it. Uh, and when the state un underfunded us by 1.8 million 2008, because you had eat the reduction, we ate the reduction. So uh, we, the the requests, the predictions we make about state aid uh, and the, the amounts that are included and in everything else, including the assessments that I'll share. I have a single financial page for that will be the conclusion of my remarks uh, will be what we will not change. OK, we'll live with it because um, the only way that 13 different local partners can plan is not to have that be a changing. Uh, and if you notice on the all inclusive report below the report is a sample of our own students and staff making improvements or in our 60 year old building. And this is the way we do it. OK, so. Um, the next page is a listing of grants and donations. The listing of the grants and donations is a snapshot in time. It lists $2.3 million in grants that were uh, have been awarded so far. Uh, as, as I speak to you tonight, uh, we have submitted a grant uh, for capital skills for 153,000. We are negotiating with uh, a foundation from Boston that has agreed to come back to meet with us and tour a second time at the end of the month on the 28th, a $400,000 request. Uh, we have worked with uh, Southwark Milton for another $90,000 request. Uh, in any case, uh, in my letter, I predicted that when the final budget is advanced, uh, there will be at least $3 million in additional grants. And so Once again, uh, we're able to, to do that uh, because we, uh, we can show matching efforts. We can, we can show uh, work and improvements we can do ourselves. We can stretch it up. That, we try to take advantage of that. Um, and the only way the grants would be extended to us is if we continue to receive the support from you and the other 12 towns to show there's a matching effort. If the communities that make the assessment portion of our budget uh, refuse or reluctant to make, uh, then why would anyone extend additional money? We like and encourage you to look at this as um, outside the standard role and responsibility over and above it, but we're delighted to do it uh, and to chase down uh, matching dollars that enhance and kind of complement the investment that we ask you to make. The next thing is BBT in the news. It talks about some of the uh, summaries of the programs. Uh, it's always a challenge to, to respond to the informational needs and community information of 13 different towns and the number of newspapers and media outlets that are all part of that. Um, and we, we try our time just to do that. Uh, obviously, we're based in one community, your colleague from Upton, uh, but we feel that we're a member of all 13 towns and do our time just to, to show respect uh, and cooperation. Okay. The next thing you have, you have some samples of some of the projects that are being done in Madden. The first one is um, in typical fashion of the partnership. Uh, and respect the whole for the sister school system, uh, which is right across the street from us. Okay, uh, have that communication. Yeah, okay. It's in Mammal Farm, and there's a picture of some of the projects on the back. Right. Uh, so this is work being done uh, at an estimated cost savings of uh, that's listed here. 
to assist um, ending up in, in, in uh, the wheelchair ramp that they use to access that building. It's just to use it as an example. The next example I have for you is the uh, Roger Wood post uh, remodeling effort. OK, once again, there's a memo and a series of photos that show some of the pictures that is our, our form of giving back to the community. It's my understanding that we're currently also uh, having conversations with the fire chief relative to doing some electrical work. Uh, so that's another department. That's another way to give back. Uh, I would emphasize that these projects are selected because they're good learning, uh, because they're safe. Uh, they're not, nobody's on a, you know, steeple or something of that nature. No one's endangered. Uh, and it's helpful to the community as a cost saving measure. It's a nice way to give back. The, uh, we recently received communications from the state that the Millwood Hospital that's based in our building, which adds to the mental health services that we provide to the students from Menden and the other students that are with us, uh, was renewed for 10 years at 150,000 per year. So that's another example. Are there any questions so far? Can you help me out again? Thank you. Here's a one page financial sheet that I want to walk through because Usually that's the crux of your interest. And just let us know if anything else that needed. We'll, we'll provide it. Right. If I may, uh, this was prepared for you for tonight. Okay. The first thing is the state has come out with the as they see, uh, with the FY24 preliminary, which is expected not to change minimum obligation, uh, which is the second box there. The one million two hundred thirty-four thousand six hundred fifty-seven is a number that you would have seen as well if you fo followed the state, and I'm not surprised that, that you would have, would have done that. For comparison purposes, I looked at the year prior, okay, and you see that listed above. What's the increase in the state's calculation uh, of the absolute minimum, and that's a, that's a total of two hundred five thousand four hundred and twenty dollars. With me so far, okay. All right, so um, however, what's the total new assessment anticipated from from your vocational technical school? The total new assessment is expected to be and is planned to be and is expected to change uh, to be an increase of 266,782, right? Um, the debt is was provided on a long term schedule. As I say, it's nearing its end and that's also listed. So let's. Um, I would point out to you that 77% of the of the increased assessment that we're making, that's the 266,000, is attributable to the state's calculation and not the Blackstone Valley Tech. Most people are aware that before 1993, that um, a regional system assessed each of its partner towns at the exact same level. But in 1993, the state uh, passed uh, legislation uh, to address court challenges about the fact that not each of the 351 communities had the same wealth value. So uh, the state now does calculations on the base of uh, total uh, property values and uh, the income levels divided that are reported to the Department of Revenue by the community. Those two factors drive an ability to pay. The state does this calculation, not only those, but a few other things. Those are the primary ingredients and then arrived at the number which directed the $205, $420 increase. OK, so a couple observations on this. Mendon enrollment within with, with us grew to 85 enrollees, OK, from 77 to 85. Uh, although it's never completely clear exactly what the impact of additional students will bring, uh, uh, what I've always done is notified the town administrator, as I did here, uh, of a community that see, sees a substantial change. I'll call it six more. Uh, students, uh, at least it's the first heads up. Well, it, it is, you know, like BB that the state will come up with a calculation of an increase, and so will we. So, um, one thing that is interesting is Menden's debt ownership, which was established 18, 20 years ago, uh, was based on a three year enrollment average at that time, which is a little different formula, right? And, and the debt is 2.6. 
but your current participation rate is 6.8. So that's a good thing for a town that's in your situation. It means the other is kind of paying the rent bill and your general occupancy. So um, I can't use that everywhere because in some cases it's not, it's a little different. Okay. Um, one of the uh, observations we made relative to the governor's plan right, is that the non-urban schools in Massachusetts uh, did not have yet to receive a major change in state revenue planning uh, under the Student Opportunity Act. We don't begrudge the urbans, but the urban systems have a significant need and have been quite successful in lobbying with the state to have substantial increased subsidies from the state in the in the next implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. Most school systems in this area uh, will receive $30 per student and only 30. That's been a an unhappy de development okay, in, in many cities. Very aware of that. Pardon? We're very aware of that. Yes, I, I, I would not be surprised. Um, we, we, we uh, as your vocational technical school, there's two things that drove us into a different category. Uh, one is the increased number of students who fell into the economically disadvantaged was a substantial change. And also because we operate under Chapter 74, which is the higher standards for vocational technical education. In any case, we will receive uh, uh, almost uh, 700,000 more in state aid, which is a big help to offsetting some of the investments. Uh, technically, it's about 600, it's 600 plus for uh, the base chapter 70 and another 50 to 60,000 in regional transportation. Right now, the regional transportation, fortunately, both school systems will enjoy the regional transportation. Um, the, the regional transportation initial projection uh, is closer to 75%, but the media and the governor releases others continue to reference that it, it's expected to be at 90%. We haven't seen a 90% number yet. We actually put in the exact number that they did. So, right, so uh, we have never played possum with you uh, relative to lowballing that. Uh, we just do our best to predict it and then uh, plan for it. If it's less than we predict, we live with it. If it's greater, well, it's probably going to roll over to excess and deficiency and be used, uh, uh, you know, in a future way. Uh, in this cycle, we drew upon our reserve. E and D is just the terminology for excess and deficiency, the equivalent of free cash for a municipality. Uh, we drew upon 100,000 to reduce the assessment to be where it was. Inquiries have been made whether or not we have choice revenue. We do not. We don't leave seats open to sell them for choice, okay, because of the interest in coming. Um, that's my summary report. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Fitzpatrick at this point? I plan on attending your town meeting as I have every year. Uh, I don't mind responding to follow-up questions if they occur or surface. Um, this is the first of the finance committee presentations, the pilgrimage, you know, kind of thing. I, I get people that I feel like a priest, a minister, or a rabbi because I'm out with hands open. Uh, it's a great story to tell you. Okay. I, I, I hope you're proud of that system because it's it's really something to behold. It's a, it's, a, it's an honor to be associated with it. I can't say enough about it. My staff is over 50% uh, Valley Tech graduates. Yeah. Yeah. There's some confusion by some will they say that, well, uh, kids are going to college. Industry constantly recruits kids to industry by offering them paid tuition to colleges now. It's like the military of years ago. No, uh, nobody goes to college for a living, okay? But most people in industry, regardless of the industry, want people to continue to learn, okay? And so the, the placement is unlimited. Uh, I call it a gateway opportunity for students. Nobody restricts what they can do. Uh, when I first started, I think they gave out twenty thousand dollars in scholarship. Last year, we gave out eight million dollars in scholarships. Okay, in some cases, those are renewable, uh, you know, based on performance by a student. Uh, but uh, you know, talk about the world is an oyster. I'm saying, if I had high school students, I don't. Uh, I would have them in that building if I could. Just before you close on 100, can you talk about the career signing day now that we've talked about college? Right, because it's a new thing and it's huge. Yeah, thank you. What, what Lonnie makes reference to is uh, an honor to honor the respect we have for the trades. Instead of just honoring students for up to an athletic scholarship or, or, or other, we started having industry signings 
okay, where people came in and and, and it was really kind of interesting from different companies throughout Eastern Massachusetts uh, and uh, did a signing, including oftentimes bonuses, put it on a little higher, but no, just yeah. so, uh, and all kind of bonuses. Uh, Never the changes. Students, uh, well, who, ex who accepted employment within those companies. Again, it's getting more attractive, you know, offering incentives. I just have actually one quick Kim, are these numbers currently baked into our current no. tracking? Okay. They as they are as of the Senate policy. Yeah, yeah, we 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 were not able to send numbers before they just came about. I, I did see the thank you for sending the spreadsheet. I did see that in the file, but it's empty. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean in fairness. Okay, so uh and the game's just beginning, if you will. Kind of thing. Yeah, I understand. I yeah. just want to know, having seen what's out there, I just want to understand. Yeah, how, right. Just more, more keeping it fluid in my own head. That's yeah. But the soonest anyone here would have noticed any impact at all, it was last middle of last week right. when the state showed that first number. Right. The, yeah. That's correct. Right. All right. So, and that's when we got it. That's when you got your, right. you could access That's when I saw it. Yeah, that, yeah. and I figured you did. Yeah. Information. Yay. Yeah, I know. Yeah. They're critical. At the bottom, put it. Representative Murray in the spot, but you hear anything about the chapter 90 money? I'm sorry, the uh, transportation money? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not specifically, and we're just starting the budget process. Other than what's in the government budget. Yeah, I just also want to echo Lonnie's comments. It's a great program. My daughter's a graduate. And, uh, she's moved on, graduated from college, out of the house, so she's that was good for me. Okay. Great. Well, I think it's just a glance at the audience. I'd be you know, remiss if I didn't recognize Joyce's contribution to our nursing program. Okay. <laughs> no. No, it's nice. To, I don't know. It's nice to be home <laughs> relative to making presentations and interacting. I grew up in Milford and Spent a lot of time in Mendon, so. so. And and I can tell you, I, I mean, I'm a Valley Tech graduate. And went on to yes to college, and and I actually have to speak to you because I work for Tesla these days, right. and yeah. uh, I need to talk to your auto tech people. And you've been a good ally for the Eagle Scout programs as well. That's very true. Yeah. And oh. another Eagle, and actually Ken O'Brien. Last year, Ken O'Brien's the real. Uh, the there's general optimism in the associations which you were affiliated that the legislature will be successful in enhancing to the degree possible relative, you know, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, well, frankly, Joyce can only do so much. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> okay. Well, doctor, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for your help. Hi, Jack. Hi. So, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Killer. Next second, the motion. And this. It's cut now. All right, here's a fire stamp going on. Right, she gets Now I hear it. Oh, the IT guy. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, everyone. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, please feel, come up and take a seat. That's much better. Yeah. Hold on.
was. Brian, do you want to take a seat up here too? Right here in the end, if you want, or wherever you want to sit. Thanks very much. I was waiting for this to reload. Just let me know, and I'll I can uh, do a little intro for you, Mr. Chair. We're just waiting for the main computer to reboot. Okay. Are you still in the meeting, Mike? Yes. If they can hear yeah, us. Is if if <laughs> I say if they can hear us. Yeah, if someone we're waiting for a second for the FinCom to uh Nick, are you uh can you come off mute? Now I see it. What do you need, Mike? Yeah, Nick, I make a motion to close the FinCom meeting. Second. Use your okay. Yeah. yeah. Nick, would you like to second? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? All those in favor? All those in favor? Those in favor? Those in favor? Those in And I just want to also recognize that uh, besides besides the representative, we have someone from uh, Congress and Jake Oshinkloss office, uh, Dana uh, is present. Is chief of staff, there she is, Dana Hansen. Hi folks. We're also present too. Hello. We met Dana and, and the Congressman Two weeks ago when they came to town and did a little took a little historic district tour and um, gave me the opportunity to, to talk to Dana about uh, the e earmark process and uh, looking for um, federal infrastructure money that might be able to help us with the next phase of this. So I invited them to come and listen to your presentation. So with that I would ask you to introduce yourselves and walk us through it. Sure, Mike. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, oh. yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I think Jack wants to maybe start. Right. Sure, sorry, yeah, Jack. I just, I just thought I'd, I'd uh, kind of give the newer members. I know Mike and Lonnie have been through the be uh, since the beginning of this, but uh, I got to Menden about a year and a half ago, a little more than that, and I, I think it was probably my first day on the job. I started hearing about the need in the lack of public infrastructure for a whole host of things, mostly economic development, but coincidentally for affordable housing and even for protecting some of the environment. So, you know, and I heard a lot of stories about where water might be and might not be, about uh, towns making deals with Menden and um, uh, kind of backing out of them. 
and on and on. And so I made it a priority um, working with, uh, well, now Chairman Maroli to try to get monies to, you know, kind of really take a good analytical look of what we have, what's possible, and where can we go with what we find. And we were fortunate enough back in the fall of 2021, maybe a little later than that, through uh, Representative Murray's office and uh, Chairman Maroli to get an earmark of $150,000. And we immediately turned that into a scope of services put them out to bid. And as you know, Mike and Lonnie, you interviewed two firms and we were lucky enough to to hire Woodward and Curran. And we've been working with them. And I know even the selectmen have, have had some workshops with them as we went on and on, um, trying to dig into what we have and what's possible. And that's what we termed as phase one, and that's what you're going to hear today. Um, simultaneously, we realized that regardless of what their their outcome is going to be, and that you're going to hear today, that we needed to go further, regardless of what direction it led us. And we immediately applied for a housing choice grant, and we were lucky enough to receive that back in November of 22 for 150,000 for to do what we thought was phase two. And then lo and behold, again, thanks to Representative Murray and Con um, and Chairman Maroli, we received another $100,000 earmark. And we are considering that phase two in phase two A. And I think at the end of this, you'll hear about that and how we can take what you hear today a step further. I will also say we've been working, it seems almost daily, but it isn't, but at least weekly with Woodward and Curran. We've worked with um, the water commissioners. Dan Byer's been um, an unbelievable resource, as well as um, a lot of other people in town. So. I just thought I, I, it would be good for those in the audience and the newer selectmen to hear a little background about how this started, and I'll leave it up to them to tell their story. And, oh, one last thing is we also took the liberty, and as the selectmen know, we uh, gave a draft of this report to the selectmen and the water commissioners. We were fortunate enough to get three or four comments back or list of comments. We've incorporated them as best as we could. And um, so it's been a collaborative effort and I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I think that's the best way to move forward. So that's my little intro. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, um, completely agree with what Jack said. It's been a great collaborative <laughs> effort. Um, and so good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Salvucci, client manager uh, with Wooder and Kern. Uh, with us tonight, Krista Forty, the project manager, and, and Zach Aronson, the project engineer. And um, I think as we get into kind of the overview of what phase one was, the phase one study was, uh, we'll talk through kind of the alternatives that came out of it, the findings, um, and just talk about those, like Jack was mentioning, kind of some clear objectives to maintain momentum and really maximize the funding that is coming down the pipeline in kind of this second phase. Um, and so as Jack mentioned too, we had a great workshop with with everyone in the fall or for, with most of you in the fall. Um, and we took a lot of that input um, and used that to help our phased approach, our prioritized areas to really kind of make this an achievable and implementable plan as much as possible um, that we'll get into here. So um, looking forward to talking about it. And I think, you know, we can get into the presentation right away, but if, if any of you want any comments before we do, um, we'll open it up to you as well. So great. Dad, jump yeah, right in. Yeah. I'll start us <laughs> off. It's great seeing everybody again. Uh, you know, September felt like just a little bit of, you know, a while, but it was just a little bit ago. So right. it's, you know, we've done a lot of work from then, so we're really happy to be able to share that with you guys. Uh, so, um, the agenda for today's uh, presentation is to go over, you know, back in, in the fall, we kind of took 
wanted to present everything. It was like almost like a progress report where where we where we were at, how how the alternatives were being developed, and what sort of conditions we were culminating as part of that. Um, now we're at the point where you know we developed the report, which culminates everything from that fall meeting, and also culminates the additional work, which included the final water source and wastewater um, alternatives mm -hmm. development. A recommended path forward and then an implementation plan. So that's what's on today's agenda is going through the actual results that came out of all the alternative development. Ah, so the water source is the first one we're going to go over. Um, so we have four alternatives that were developed as part as part of uh, a water sourcing location, um, inclusive to every single one of these potential alternatives. Uh, is a well site, a treatment building, a storage tank, and uh, the distribution. And from the feedback that we received back in the fall, we clarified that the areas that are highest priority, we, we segmented it out to a few areas, but based on some of the initial flow uh, flow numbers, we kind of worked on really serving the areas, priority areas one and two as defined on the screen, but is route 16, Route 140 and the connecting area in between, you know, running up Bellingham Street, East Pro, uh, Providence Ave, and up to Route 16. Um, so, alternative one is a well site just north of Providence Street and Hartford Avenue East. Uh, alternative two is just north of Thayer Road, sort of near um, the the waterway there, and then alternative three is just is in the southern end of Menden near the Blackstone border. And then alternative four is no action. Sorry, a little bit technical difficulties. So uh, alternative one is presented on the screen now. All these figures and everything I'm going to go through for each alternative is within the, the report. I hope you guys have a chance to look through. If not, we can you know take any questions on it. Uh, but generally this, like I said, each each one of these maps you're going to see or show the the alternative location, a parcel wh where we are having the well site and where we are planning on putting storage. It shows the existing infrastructure and it shows proposed infrastructure. Uh, so this well site is located, like I said, just north of East Pro uh, uh, Providence and East Hartford Ave. And it's on a town owned parcel. Uh, in in a lower yield aquifer that's considered that's a con um, but in general it's a great location for potential water source development um, some pros and cons are listed on the screen here i'm gonna not not spend too much time on them because like, as i said this, these are things that were included in the report uh, just for your information and also there's a capital and o and m cost and cost estimate presented for each one of these alternatives which looked at construction engineering land acquisition o and m and, and total life cycle cost then provided in a uniform cost of the lot so the alternative view is a well site location just north of thayer road in an uh privately owned parcel where there's a pocket of a uh, high yield aquifer. Um, when I see say high yield aquifer, I'm referring to the mass DEP uh, groundwater aquifer layers that are pulled from the US uh, USGS uh, survey, where they they went and actually delineated a lot of these these areas uh, over over a year. Uh, there's a pocket in this location. It is on a private privately owned parcel. Um, and would take some development in terms of roadway access and things like that. Um, but that is another uh, the second alternative. And again, pros and cons. Joyce, um, Joyce, you have a if you want to take a seat up here, Joyce, too, there's one more chair, I think. Is you know, has the board yeah. of health. I'm wondering you can take the <laughs> I'm wondering where the Thayer Road one is. Uh, is it at the end of the road? Uh, it's just north of Thayer Road. Um, it's it, the Thayer Road is actually it's a little hard to see, but it's oh, on the wrong next one. 
it's it's a little further north, probably. You know, Thayer Road is right here where my cursor is, mm -hmm. and the well site location is right here. Is it near the pipe, near the gas pipeline? No, it's further north than that. Further north, yeah. So that's going to be down the down the far end of. No, so not up at the Bates Street end of Thayer Road, but down near the other end. I I can't tell from the. Yeah, right. I can pull up. So. Yeah, we can do that. I can just pull. I gotta unshare my screen because right now they're only seeing the. I'm gonna unshare my screen for a sec here. Mm -hmm. Just so you guys can see the part too. Mm -hmm. So this is the parcel where we're looking at right here. Which one? Three Bay Street. There's just a small oh, delay. Oh, it's okay. Oh. oh, okay. But it's okay. it's north of Thayer Road in terms of yes. Thayer Roads here. Yeah. Right. So. So it's basically on the farm road. road. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is where that location is. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna get us back on. Yeah. That is the well site. Yep. Or alternative two. All right. So alternative three um, is shown shown now. So it's great. There's, there's actually two locations shown on this map. Uh, there's a location for a privately owned parcel, and there's also a town owned parcel here. Um, this this area was looked at because it was heavily documented as probably one of the best areas in Menden in terms of wa uh, potential water source through multiple studies, previous studies and reports conducted in Menden. And generally, the uh, surficial geology and the uh, groundwater aquifer yield layer showed great pocket of water in this location. Obviously, in terms of the service area, we're looking at the farthest away from the service area. It's funny how that works. Um, but um, that that is why this location, in terms of if we had to throw something on mark, we would say this is probably an area where we're seeing probably the best potential for a good water source. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. That's so why we have alternative three. Is that green area? Is that Grover Field? Mm, this is a this is right at the back of a. Small subdivision. I can pull that up. Yeah, well, we have a small subdivision. It could be. So it's. Let me pull this up. Here. Sorry, I'm not dealing with the mouse here. It's right along the Mill River. So that's Colonial. It's right. It's this one right here. Yeah. Right hey. after Massasoit Way. Oh, off the of, okay. So the east side of the river. Oh, so that's behind. Old yeah. South Woods. Right. Yeah, that's right, right next door to my house. Yeah. But that's not. It's not that far off of the service area. I mean, we're not. We're not. Walking. No, it's not a ton, but it's it just in terms of where the other ones are. Okay. Away from the other, the other. Right. It's exactly. Right. So in terms of when you're you're talking about in comparison to the other alternatives, I just believe it was the Blackstone Town Line. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's all. Right. right. What, which it is fairly close, right? Um, but not not the end of it. So when when you look at that. That that red parcel, that town owned parcel, mm -hmm. that's just south of the one I was just showing you. This one here. That's this one, and this is a little further south and close to the back zone line. But there's a pocket of um, high yield aquifer in this along this parcel as well. Um, but again, where where the previous studies and reports point to is the location just north, and it's in a privately developed parcel. So we're kind of using both of those right now uh, as part of a you know future phasing to look at. Um, but it's you know we want to identify both because obviously town owned land is more favorable than you know reaching out to uh, private developers or private private property owners. Uh, so can you talk about the one in between that's so it's in between Massasoit and Colonial in where the power lines are? So the power lines I believe are 
talking about this one here. Power lines, I believe, are just south, kind of where these uh you see these yellow shades are in your yeah. the GIS. Yeah. So it's just the power lines are just south. Yeah. Well, the, the power lines are. This is pulling. The power lines are right here. Yep. Correct. Right. And where is the proposed one? Like? Uh, so the proposed one's farther north. Um, and then this area, this for alternative three, we're kind of looking at two areas. Yeah. Um, depending on you know future phasing, but this this area is one the town owned parcel here, Meadowbrook Conservation Area, and then also it's a little further north. One with the private parcels, just okay. Alpha mass, so it way on the inside. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, so in terms of cost, uh, we kind of went through them quickly, but the 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 highest, the lowest cost is alternative one, just because it's relative location. You're not gonna have as much piping that needs to go in. Uh, alternative two is the next, the next lowest, and then alternative three is the highest cost because we, just just due to distribution and transmission piping. That's it, because and most of these are pretty similar, right? Because all the components are fairly similar in what they are going into. It's just it's distribution and transmission piping is the difference in them. Um, so that is the water source alternatives. I'm going to turn it over to Kristen now for some of the for the I just have one alternative. question. If you go back to that previous page and you gave the numbers. Yep. So is this is this number is to basically develop the source and create it. This is to yeah, this is the full number and we're going to get into a little later at how how we can actually accomplish this okay. and do right. accomplishable tasks, break it up for more manageable pieces. I'm just wondering if that number that th does that include distributing the water to the for the intended commercial the customers on 16 stuff. and 140? Yes, correct. That includes okay. that includes all the route 16 the corridor in between uh, Route 16, Route 140, and the connecting corridor between Bellingham and the other areas. And the costs are just for those specific locations. So when you're talking about distance, right. to get back to the primary objective of the study, right? I'm just curious. Do you look if we were to if that needed to be broadened, would that change any of your thinking about location? Right. So if you were to go in another direction. So any of these more well, we had we had defined, especially Long and I were saying that we had defined that this was specifically the understood. question. Yeah, understood. But I would think that and I'm not saying we're, we're even going there. But yeah, right here it's very specific location cost to these two areas, as an example, the 140 and 16. Right. If there was are any of these more centrally located, if you were to have a phase three, four, five, or six, right. and you want to bring all of Menden up on town water as an example, right? right? I don't know. So in terms of the well site locations, right? Like, I'm, we we definitely consider pri the priority areas as yep. as where we look at, but we also had to keep in mind that there's not a ton of places to to put, put holes in the ground uh, for well for well source, right? When you we have to look at sand and gravel walk aquifers per Mass DP guidelines before we look at uh, bedrock aquifers, and the the largest source of sand and gravel aquifer right along the mill river and muddy muddy brook mm -hmm. uh, and all those areas as you know come pretty much from you know the northeast side of menden and just go straight down to to um you know southeast side of Menden. um so when we talk about sourcing um i don't right. think it would really change depending on the surface area um it's just more so you know those are the locations that we had to deal with to get the water where it, it needed to be. So I guess to answer your question, I don't know if those locations would change if you change the service area. I don't, or don't I mean, I don't I think the question change. I would say is, is the highest cost actually long term give us any benefit? Right, right, right. right. Well, like, and sounds like it's more yeah. of a moot point. Right. Okay. I think we'll we'll know more once we know what's in the ground. That's going to dictate right. the limitations. Well, Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Part the of their phase the two phase. scope is to uh, kind of do that type of analysis, Mike, to right. dive okay. deep into the cost of benefit. Yep, perfect. Yeah, and we're going to get more into that in a sec. I know it's hard not to like want to jump on it, and yep. but we are certainly going to cover that piece to scope and what that involves. Zach, can I can so. I just interrupt for one second? I, I realize, sure. you know, I'm always thinking about people that are tuning in now and have no idea how we got to even talk about this, but um, we spent months and months of interviewing every abutting town 
every water department and sewer department about a partnership, yep. um, buying water from them or, or using sewer uh, resources from them. And right. not surprising, and I know Mike and, and Wally know this, we didn't get a very good reception. Uh, they were all polite, but it was, you know, we're going to keep what we got. Sorry. There was maybe a little movement from Hopedale, but even that was years and years out. So the 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 idea of a partnership with another town, though there were many stories about it, doesn't seem to be uh, uh, a high priority right now. And then from the tabletop discussion we had with the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board and all kinds of boards at one night, we zeroed in on where the rumors and available land is and uh, where possible water resources are. So that's where they started looking first, and that's how we got to where we're on. Yeah, great point, Heck. Um, th those were all the, the areas we looked at. at um, we tried, you know, looking at neighboring communities and seeing what, how we got here, and it eventually led us to a point where where mended sourcing was. The, the front we needed to, to go. And if history tells us anything about this, it's that they don't want to do business with us. Yeah. We've been trying to get us off for years. So if we're going to do it, let's just do it ourselves like we do everything else. We've tried <laughs> a million times. Yeah. Good point. Is there a possible impact to residents near the well and their wells? <laughs> oh, so the idea, that's a good question. Um, the at this point, we, we still need to know what, what we're dealing with in terms of the actual draw from the wall before we can even make that sort of determination. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's something we can certainly get back to uh, once we once we go through that. Uh, with my proximity to uh, <laughs> well, well, the first number, number, two. number two, I'm very glad that I stuck around for this. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, my wealth works great right. and I don't want that to change. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, it, it's a definitely dependent on what the actual conditions are yeah. when we start going. So. Okay. All right, so moving on to the wastewater alternatives. So similarly, we evaluated some alternatives for sewer collection in town. Um, so all the alternative, both alternatives that we evaluated include um, providing sewer in those priority areas, Route 16, Route 140, and the connection. We also included the homes around Nipmuc Pond because we know they're on tight tanks. Um, and both of these alternatives are assuming three pumps free pump station, kind of a, an assumption, but similar between the alternatives. Alternative one is a new wastewater treatment facility in town in Menden. And alternative two is connecting to Hopedale's wastewater treatment facility, which is located right off Route 16. And alternative three is no action or do nothing. Um, there we go. Uh, so, Alternative one is a treatment facility in town. Don't focus too much on the location. I put the location on the map to show you that we looked at parcels that had sufficient acreage for a treatment facility and disposal system. So, um, you know, certainly if this was an alternative that the town wanted to move forward with, we would take a closer look at where the facility would be located. Um, but we needed a facility, we needed um, land, uh, that could both house the wastewater treatment facility and also a groundwater discharge system, um, which take up, takes up some land as well. So um, for the purpose of this evaluation, we um, we have a location north of Route 16 on North Ave, um, which had sufficient, um, sufficient uh, space and what those are undeveloped parcels. So again, building a treatment facility in town, um, and and discharging through groundwater discharge in Massachusetts, you can no longer um, and no new uh, communities can discharge to a surface uh, surface water discharge. So from here on out, it's all discharge oh, really? uh, uh, groundwater. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but but we could still tie into an existing one across the state. Correct. Okay. But but there's a caveat to that. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so I'll, so um, pros and cons to having a treatment facility. I mean, the biggest advantage is control. The town amended would have control over rates and would be able to, you know, think about future expansion and, and um, yeah, with comes responsibility, obviously, and responsibility for maintaining and operating a wastewater utility and a treatment facility is is a lot, is a lot, and with that comes a uh, really high cost. Um, so this, uh, the costs that we have here are are preliminary, but um, it's really not an economical option. If there are other options to pursue with Hopedale, it's preferred over building a plant in Menden. Just doesn't make sense for um, the area and the, um, that we're talking about here. It's expensive, so. So alternative two, like I said, is um, the same, servicing the same area, but sending sewer, or sending wastewater to Hopedale's wastewater treatment facility. Um, we, Need, definitely need to do further evaluation um, if the town chooses to pursue this more to work with Hopedale and really understand how much capacity they have at at that plant. We've had a couple conversations with um, with Hopedale, and they've indicated they have um, extensive inflow and infiltration, which is um, basically their plant is maxed out with of um, with their well, uh, basically. Uh, reaching their their permit limit because of II, and if they can if they can find the sources of inflow and infiltration, that flow will go down, and they'll have capacity for um, a potential connection. So they've got seepage or leaks, yeah, or Correct. rainwater coming in, something yeah, right. like that. Yeah, some pumps, things that aren't wastewater flow, right. taking up space in their treatment plant. Leader connections, those types of things. That when it rains is when they. <laughs> During dry weather, not that, but what they've indicated is during rain events, which is very common, which are yeah, super common for everyone, Massachusetts communities, New England communities, I should say. So to to your question, um, right now, Hopedale has a has a surface water discharge, uh, assuming um, they can take additional flow and st with still within their current permit, everything is good. But if that if 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 this additional flow requires Hopedale to increase their permit uh, discharge that would require groundwater they would have to have they would have anything over their current limit they have to have water. Water. yes yeah so in that case is there a sufficient land area where they are to add that piece in exactly. and would that fall under our development piece um, so we, we didn't look at that yet. Okay. We did not look at that yet. Um, we have a, a general idea of the, the current capacity at their plant, but we definitely need, um, to dive in a little deeper. Okay. Yeah. And, and the numbers that I'm going to show you here are assuming that there is no additional groundwater discharge that is needed in Hotel. So the idea is we accounted for some costs, to help them reduce their inflow and infiltration. So seal the pipes, um, you know, find those uh, illegal connections. Uh, Things like stormwater management tie into that. It, that's part of it. It's part of the inflow part of it, the infiltration yeah, parts, the leaks and the cracks and the things. So, right. so it's one. 50% of it potentially. And as you can um, see, it's still expensive. Yeah. 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 It's still, very, yes, it's still, it's still very expensive. We don't have and I was just going to say that the difference is $33 million. When you're, when you're up in those numbers, yeah. What's the if difference? You, if right? you lop off the yeah first couple of sections here, you know, you, you <laughs> and we have control. It, it's, I don't know. Well, but, I mean, it still might be a pipe dream, but yeah. But keep in mind, we were talking about this during our meetings. The more communities that are involved potentially jointly on a project, the more opportunities we have for funding that sure. open up. And so, even if it doesn't look directly like there's a benefit, it actually is funding wise when it benefits multiple communities. Oh, I get it. Yeah. And we did a very preliminary betterment cost per connection um, for both of these alternatives. And um, the cost per connection is between 130 and $180,000 per connection. Now that's very preliminary. Sure. 
Um, Seems but nice it, 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 <laughs> it should be able to pass as a town meeting. Joyce gets one since she's on the corner. Do you get two of those down from Washington Street? I No, thank you. Sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> So I guess just to summarize where we are right now, um, both from the drinking water alternatives and the wastewater. So for drinking water, what we're proposing um, is, you know, we've looked at, we have potential well sites, but we really need to understand what's in the ground, what's the quality of the water and how much water is there. Uh, so the next phase of this is, is a test well program where we actually find some of that information out. Um, so we're looking, we're proposing to look at each of those three alternatives um, that Zach went, went through to those locations um, and see, and see, you know, what kind of actual yield there is and, and also look at water quality. Um, I know I joke about the benefit fees, but that benefit fee is if we had no funding. If we correct. decided to pay correct. Correct. Right. Make that fee. Correct. <laughs> but between... Sorry. <laughs> we're going to get it fully funded. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, and for and for wastewater, based on the the costs that we're these are again preliminary costs, but based on this, we're recommending um, no action. And if you want to pursue okay. um, the discussions with Hopedale, let's let's under fully understand. Um, the capacity that they have at their plant, um, and and like you said, bring that we, that number needs to come down obviously significantly. And, and again, if, if funding based on what Kim was saying, if funding is better with a community effort, and they can get better because of it, and we can get better because of it, then not see that. I'm sorry, and that's just my yeah. Same. Oakdale amendment is in the same congressional district. Too. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> just saying. I heard that. I'm still listening. I I was hoping you were. Did you hear the part about fully funded? <laughs> <laughs> so what we are um what we've laid out here is just kind of a phase approach moving forward. Um, phase one is this project that we just completed now, this preliminary evaluation of the alternatives. What we're proposing for phase two is that test well program. Um, and should the town be interested in starting those discussions with Hopedale on the wastewater um, side of things as well, that could be part of phase two. Um, after phase two, we hope to have an idea of how much water is in the ground, the quality of that water, and we'll be able to fine tune the, the project costs associated um, and where we think the best location or locations for wells could be. And based on that, um, we put together some kind of a breakout of potential um, design and construction projects. So it's not all happening at once, um, but that you're building the well and the treatment first and 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 then you're built, um, you know, you're kind of building your distribution out over a phased uh, over over you know in 20 years whatever whatever that um, time frame looks like so um uh, just to jump in um this this phased approach how we're currently showing it really is heavily dependent especially 3a and 3b being split out like that because we're showing uh, basically uh uh the storage tank being built after we do the well site and uh treatment building really is heavily dependent on on what we we see for flows as part of phase two so i just want to make that clear mm -hmm. um but what it's designed to do is show manageable steps in completing the project and the, the greater project right uh based on serving priority areas one and two um, yeah, and I would, so we, I would... we have this what was that oh that's jack just button in oh. as, as usual. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say, we also talked about even breaking them down even to smaller phases that are maybe a little more manageable financially. That's all. Um, but we and, don't and know. Just to show, and that's exactly it, Jack. Uh, as we are going through phase two, that, that it's going to 
really set the roadmap as far as what the next phases are because we have to understand what we have for water underground. It, you can't, we can, we can sort of set the roadmap in terms of what steps, steps need to ha happen, but in terms of how you get there, that those, you need to understand what you have. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm going to get into these, or Krista, sorry, I jumped in real quick. You can keep too. going. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I already touched on this, but again, phase, like I said, phase two is that it would be a test well program where we would drill up to five, five wells um, throughout those different locations um, and do some water quality testing too. Um, we, we would perform some hydraulic modeling to understand, um, you know, determine capacity at those new source locations. Um, we would look financially, um, not only at like, what does that new project cost look like, but also some revenue versus debt service um, projection or analysis, um, and certainly touch on funding options um, for the project. And we would kind of summarize that and update a report. And said, here's our here's our findings, and um, you know, hopefully have better idea of, of overall project costs and and phasing moving forward. And should the town want to pursue you know a conversation with Hofield, we could certainly um, uh, include that as part of the next phase. What's the time frame for phase two? So the, the the plan would be to start in the next couple months, um, and would probably I think be a, a year. Yeah, I would like to get these guys uh, with your permission eventually under contract within the next month so they can start right now after tonight. They're no longer under contract with phase one. Yeah, so this is just a graphic rep representation of um, of the phasing. It's a little hard to see here. Um, maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, could, Zach, could you or Scott or Krista, maybe for those, explain what water system we now have in Menden? There might yeah. be some people that don't know that, and we see all these little bubbles around here. Yeah, of course. So if, if we're looking at the... Um, the purple areas with the, the blue lines in the middle and these little subsystem labels on the outside. That's the current water water system in terms of water public water infrastructure in Menden. Um, they're formally named the Cape Road subsystem, Route 16 subsystem, and Dudley Road subsystem. They're all fed by the town of Hopedale um, and wholly supplied from there. And uh, just if, if I it, yeah. just to touch on that, I believe the six, the Route 16 and the Dudley Road, <clears throat> or at least Route 16, is mandated for them to supply the water at the moment, mm -hmm. and they they get I believe they don't pay the rates that we that. That's correct. That's Mike, you know that's better than correct, this. Correct, Lonnie. Uh, the um, the water commissioners are in control of Cape the Cape Road subsystem. The other two, I believe, are not under the water commissions. They're, That's our understanding. Right. They're just like regular Oakdale yeah. residents. They pay yeah. whatever. They're rate payers like, whatever. like right. all the whole yeah. So generally, that's those are the, you know, the areas. And as you can see, the Cape Rope subsystem is obviously the, the largest subsystem. Uh, it includes a portion of Route 140, uh, or a sizable portion of Route 140 that's in, in Mendon. Um, so that that everything else, as you most folks know, is are on private wells, private septic with, within the town. There's no sewer infrastructure in the town. Of there is one one more thing you may or may not know is that um, two commercial properties at the south end of 140 that are on the Bellingham line are both supplied with water by. Oh, I think we heard that before. Yeah. Bellingham, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> And they were Lowell they built their own connection. Lowell's, which was Mark Lochness and Copart. And they were, and this whole Cape Road subsystem originally was supposed to be part. was well was no, it was originally Bellingham, right? When it was first, because Varney Concrete, which is in Bellingham, also owns the farm. And you see Varney's, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. was that was the he's long gone now, but he just told the town of Bellingham connect. 
and then the people that got the Cape Road and the and the Bait Street connection were employees of his oh, that very nice. made it happen. They showed up at a special town meeting and I don't know, voted on like 12 people with there or something in 19. Funny how whatever. that happens. Right. There's a lot of history into those those <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But in any case, um, just for those that that's the sort of setup and and um the actual phasing of the, this project, um phase phase one is phase three, I'm sorry. Three for starting from the end of phase two on this this map, right? Is the Phase 3A distribution from the well site to Route 16 up up in this area, right right where my cursor is now. And then the Phase 3B, and again, this is heavily dependent on the amount of flow that we are pulling out of out of the ground, uh, will be from Route 16 to uh, you know the area of the storage tank. The storage tank location is right behind. Um, Route, the Route 16 major corridor right off of uh, right near Taft Ave and uh, Millville Street. Just so you're aware, that's a town owned parcel, mm -hmm. uh, baseball fields, I believe. Um, phase four is the connection um, to Cape Road, you know, the, the existing infrastructure that already exists. It's in orange there, this area. Mm -hmm. Phase five is building out the Route 16. Subs uh, Route 16 corridor, all the purple, and it includes a small portion up to the school on on North Ave. And then phase six is finishing off, connecting through the remainder of the Route 140 corridor. What was the thing behind the water? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, How to connect so to existing water where 16 is phase. Five. Five. Yeah. So, any up to 16 first, yeah. where the other? So, those two can very well be switched. The only reason we this one was done in that manner yeah. is so we show on 3A yeah. that there's a portion here that connects here. We're, we're choosing a, a look. We had to choose a location because it's three alternatives. But as if alternative two were, be, were to be implemented, it would cross the Cape Road system right. and effectively connected at that time. So in terms of what one would get done first, you know, to accommodate all alternatives, it, it was done that way, but certainly could be changed if needed, uh, especially phase four and phase five. The idea too is that's also the biggest, the, the most amount of pull in terms of um, water, water demand, right? So you could, you could pull from that area. So. And as Jack mentioned, you know, the limits of going all the way up Route 16 in either direction, that could be phased, that could be prioritized. There's, there's all sorts of different. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask, I'm just wondering about uh, the biggest benefit, benefit to the town is the Route 16. Right. And sooner than later, if we were right. to go that route. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. 140 or 16 is yeah, either one. Yes. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there's probably even more more development opportunities on 140 than we even other than the, the last piece that we have it's there that i mean i'm sure everybody along the way is going to collect but as far as new opportunity for us for for our commercial growth it would be probably more than 140 yeah at the moment is that much closer to 495 all of that yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, i think yeah. also it's like you know, you, you connect to that subsystem. These guys have already heard me say it 10 oh, times right. over near where we already have it zoned industrial across the street. So one of the aquifer locations is or at the corner. Oh, you mean oh, you adjacent mean, oh, to the highway garage and across the street yeah. is our industrial area. And even though the yield is, is less, the potential for return could be greater to us because we already have it zoned yeah. and there's a parcel that basically lines up behind that that goes to where they would like to put the tower which is near the ball field that also is in that sure. same stretch there in terms of build out right about mm -hmm. 
right. getting it, something that really quicker, can, right? Connecting the dots, really, and and really being smart about it. I think we got to pay a lot. Once we know the yield and what's possible, then we can start connecting these dots in the best way possible, the most strategic way. Uh, the plans for um, Route 16, the state plans for uh, resurfacing that I mean it strikes me that putting water mains will involve digging up the roads so like it seems like the timing of that route 16 uh work should be coordinated coordinated with that absolutely. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely spend dig, dig it once resurface it once yeah absolutely yeah. uh um yeah and the only other thing I was going to say about connection to Cape Road is like that's that's a set of customers that you can immediately turn on it's not like you're laying services and it closed the valve to, to hope to right and then you have a, you have all the, the customer base right that suit like you don't laying services you don't have to go through all that it's another reason why it was based but whatever makes sense in terms of downsides for those who it certainly can i ask you do you have any uh information regarding back in the day uh when we did some testing because I, I'm pretty sure that they did some testing <clears throat> where the lake is across Kinsley Lane up in the hill. I think that may have been a, a rock aquifer. Right, right. uh, 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 but they, they did some testing and the, the, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if that is any information about that, except in my brain. So they, I know they, in 1986, they went through a, like they went through and looked at all the, the groundwater resources and re and actually in 2000 they expanded upon it a couple two different firms um bedrock aquifers were looked at in terms of where fracture fractures were right. but i don't know if i don't remember them actually doing any sort of testing out there for bedrock aquifers yeah. or based on the, yeah, based the, on those reports the other thing you said at the beginning too was we have to exhaust the gravel right. first Right, I, I, yeah, I, I just was wondering, because that is so close to Route 16 right. itself that I didn't, I just was thinking about that. And, and at the time, again, it, that was that was a while ago. I right. don't think of how long ago it was, but. Right. So in, I will tell you in that area. They did, say that, they did say they did some testing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was on the board of health at that time. Right. Back, and back in the chain. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I know I know in that general area from that 2000 or 2002 report, they did reference that that was a, a fracture where, where there's yeah, a fracture yeah, pinch point. Yeah, yeah. That area was a decent spot. But, it, you know, in terms of public water system development, the guidelines are pretty clear on developing. It. And, you know, if you can't, if you exhaust all options as far as sand and gravel aquifers go, then then, you know, you start moving on to bedrock aquifers. Right. Source. I'm just thinking things are tight as to Route 16. Yeah, right. My area, my area. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm with you. Zoom out. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Good. All right. So just closing out, I just wanted to note there's different, there's several different funding options. I mean thinking big picture here of how to fund these projects. Um, there's opportunities with district improvement financing or DIP, which is a capital recovery option. Certainly sewer veteran assessments is, is an option. Also, um, we do a lot of work with uh, state revolving fund and clean water um, and drinking water SRF funding um, at low interest loans um, and certainly federal funding, um, whether it be earmarks or infrastructure bills. So there's definitely options. We've also put a laundry list of uh, more specific uh, funding opportunities that we'd be happy to work with the town moving forward on kind of figuring out which ones um, should be pursued. I'm not going to go through all this, but there's a long list there. <laughs> and that's all we have. So, um, any questions? I have one question, uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first being uh, the connection to the school system. I know we kind of emphasized that in September. Mm -hmm. um, did you include that any, in any of your cost estimations for the alternatives? It, it's, it's included. So, to, right now it's just 
to the cloth school. Um, it hasn't gone up uh, to Mexico. Um, we we can look at that as future as a future thing as we hone in on as part of our you know hydraulic modeling effort. Uh, but th that as as far as it stands right now, we didn't want to go too far that way because it, it's up in elevation. Increase cost because there need to be some sort of pumping booster pumping station or that sort of thing. So basically, the current that's higher than what is right. And, and uh, at the stage we're at right now, right? Like we're looking at area we serve. You know, all the demand that's associated with it, and you know, based on the groundwater uh, water management act permitting tool, uh, there's information that we you know a certain amount of demand you start pulling from a, a sub basin aquifer you can start to go over thresholds for how much mitigation and and water you put back into the ground because every, every all the extra water you pull out of the ground you have to get it back in the ground to recharge the aquifer um, so you start going over those thresholds with demand then you start, so it, before we got too far along and we knew what those those demand numbers were i mean those thresholds were we wanted to stay within, you know, a reasonable amount and ser serve as much as the town as we could. But, you know, we got to, you know, before we even get to that step, we need to understand how much water we can pull out of the ground. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That seems like a reasonable approach. When we're talking about storage. It's a traditional water tower. Yeah, so it's a, it would be a, a pedestal spheroid tank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, big ball looks like golf ball. Yeah. Top. Gets you the activation you need for the adequate pressure in your systems. And, and that would serve even over the Cape Road subsystem? Correct. Okay, cool. I have one more question actually for Jad, I think. Um, uh, option number one, the town owned parcel. So I know that there's some other intended uses for that parcel right now. So how much does this interfere with that and how do the plans have to be kind of tied together? Jack, did you? Oh, is that that's me? Yeah, um, <laughs> it kind of sounds like tax. So like <laughs> yeah, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about, Brendan. We are we have a proposal out now for an affordable uh, housing project up to 40 units, and the um, existing senior center and the uh, DPW are there. Senior center wishes to expand. Um, we, I think this might complement it. If indeed it's the type of system we're hoping, then they would just tag along. You know, timing is everything. And if we find a nonprofit who's willing to build the uh, affordable housing uh, project, they're going to want to move as quickly as possible. So, and we already have a well cited for that um albeit on the other side of the wetlands so it's something we need to talk about not a question not a question but i'd like to think that this if if it's feasible i'd like to think that they could all be married into it any other questions great study well Yes, sir. certainly that report has a lot more information in, it in this presentation. And um, like Jack said, there's all sorts of documentation about the talks we had with the neighboring communities and just everything we looked at the past studies, you know, just creating this new baseline to kind of start from when you're when you're considering wastewater and drinking water for the community. So a lot of information in there. We're happy to answer questions as you continue to look through it. But this was certainly the high level overview to give you kind of the, the summary of recommendations. But but the key is the next step is to find out exactly how much water is available in the ground in those three areas. Right, and then, right. And then yeah, you know the, the hydraulic modeling. Right, right. The quality too is a good point. Um, yep. And then the hydraulic modeling associating with building out that that system, you know, based on the results of the the test well program and the financial capability. So it's all it's all meshed together because you can't do one without the other. And the num and and that number to do that. Next phase was 300k. That's with a wastewater evaluation as well. Yes, yeah, so two, 250,000. I got 250, so I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 what I'm going to ask them to do with your permission, Mike, is to have them put together a scope which I can share with the selectmen 
And then, you know, you're going to have to make a decision. I'd like you to make a decision on whether you want them to pursue the wastewater or not. One the, sorry. Sorry. One of the things that we've been talking about the last couple of years, and I just I want to reiterate and thank you. You know already how appreciative I am about this baseline that I was insisting that we have so that we can start having data to make decisions from and how critical it is to move to this phase two or 2A or whatever it is to get these numbers that we need to really see if this is feasible or not and sort of either keep this discussion going for forever or end it for forever, right? And that's what we need to move forward. And one of the things this board and actually previous board to this one um, prioritized using ARPA funds related to water and sewer infrastructure, and we haven't touched it right. for this purpose. Um, so we have about $1.8 million sitting as a match or as for the next phase. So Jack has done an excellent job of going out and getting all these grants in addition. But we have, we're holding on to that and hope that this isn't just a report that sits on a shelf and that we actually get this data. And so when Jack comes back with his scope, my recommendation is going to be that we make a vote in order to use the additional funding from that 100000 in order to move on to the next phase. Or what if you decide to do sewer at this point or not? That you know that's where it would come from. Well, I mean, when we talk about when we talk about three hundred thousand dollars and two hundred fifty, yeah, we'll say. Well, I'm sorry. Say this again. You said you had two hundred fifty thousand dollars to use, and the estimate's three hundred thousand dollars. Is that where we're at, Jack? Correct. Yes. 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 Yeah. I think it's a good use of fifty. How much of how much of that is 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 the sewer? Fifty thousand. So it's fifty. To go down to Hopedale and see if we want to do it. Are we talking about our own location? <laughs> I don't mean to be no, silly about it. I'm no, just, I want to get a sense from the town of Menden how come, like, right. well, now we're collaborating with another town, right? right? So, what do we want to do and what do we not want to not do? It? And, and we can fine tune that number. I, I didn't know, um, I wanted to kind of he understand how, what everyone was feeling before we proceed proceeded with wastewater because I, I think we definitely want to have a meeting with the water board and talk about this too about thoughts based upon this report right and next steps so that we're all aligned and where we're going right okay. and I think that's part of the scope they'll come back and then we'll bring them into right again yeah. and make sure that we're talking together yeah I, I should have been making the jack to write it up yeah I, I should have added that um, Scott and I did go in front of the water commissioners. What was it a month ago, Scott? So they're pretty up to speed on what's there. I don't know if Vinny's at the meeting. I know that um, Kevin and and um, Dan couldn't make it tonight, but uh, uh, yeah, we can brief them on the scope as well. But I'd like to be able to bring you, you know, a, a scope that that's agreeable, so we can get them under contact as soon as possible. Because I don't want to lose momentum here. This is pretty important stuff. Even if we have a schedule of an extra meeting. To yeah. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Okay. Okay. I mean. I almost like to see who are all pertinent stakeholders within the town and start having one meeting with all stakeholders to so we can start making decisions. Idea. Yeah, we've That's been it. having group meetings with with people this entire time, right? right because we're, we're no key decisions really needed to be made. We're getting to that and now we're there, yeah. which is why I'm saying make sure that we do it right since we've got one great shot at this. Right? Let's make sure we're all in the same room so that there's no confusion about what was agreed to or not agreed to or where we're going, right? You might disagree about water or sewer, but that's a discussion to be had, right? right. So. I think uh, the things that, that uh, in terms of sewage that uh, I think you have to think about is that Oakdale is planning a quite a big uh, development in their center down there, so that's going to take another bundle. Yeah, of capacity, right? Yeah, right. using the capacity. Right. So you say we better hurry up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're planning. That's part of their plan. Yeah, that's right. in their plan, and it has to do with all kinds of things. So, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, the, the drape, right, the drape, yeah. the drape of the thing, it, and it's so, hold up. I think you that, hole. that big open hole there yes, in the center yeah, of the brain. Right. And, uh, and, and so that, you know, 
that's going to be compromising their sewer treatment plant. Correct. It, and uh, I think that's, that's a part of like what the phase two, what we preliminary laid it out as for wastewater evaluation, we'll be getting sort of that information in addition to like looking at the treatment plant and take, taking a site visit there. What I will say is that uh, based on preliminary discussions with Hopedale, their their dry weather flow, meaning no rain, is very low compared to their per actual permit permitted yield. It's just during that wet weather, and and that's where that the I I component is. The I I component is key for that, right? Like if we can help mitigate that system, yeah, which is and there is ways we can it's never just one smoking gun <laughs> to that George, but flow. especially if the numbers work that's part of the phase two thing that you were so uh looking at so just to caveat that was a conversation we had so we would want to look at some real data confirm right. confirm what their plans are um you know right. we could i think it was all this data gathering part of phase two potentially okay so Let's just call that 50k a placeholder until him and I talk and figure okay. out what you know what's that scope going to be. So yeah, I think the good news is we're all really excited to keep it going. It sounds like Jack suggested let's put together a formal scope for phase two with cost, right? Like tomorrow, <laughs> and they are they bring it back if we need an extra meeting, right? So yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, there's no words. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. A lot of information. Brian, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Budget time is here again, so Jim's going to be getting an email. Budgets you have to give us. 133 million. That's right. All right. Thank you. That was the plan. No, this is this is really exciting. You know, this is it's down, you know, getting this concrete information this plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Michael, like, will we be able to upload these reports to the website? Mm -hmm. Yes. Please. So I think they're already there. Dan had asked me to oh, put them okay. on. Yeah, the only thing we don't sure. the only thing we don't <laughs> is, is that was the valley tech no but they, i think i think this the water's up now you can put the, i think the dls is live on their site but we can put that one on our site yeah, here. and then the budget documents are all in except yeah. for the hard copy perfect so. yeah. we have we have emails of the we have a the, the dls document so we can put it on the drive and actually put it on the website yeah, I think people will be interested in downloading it. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Why don't we uh, circle back to our town hall update? Sure. So um, two meetings ago, I told you that we were starting again downstairs. Our bids came in. Uh, Danny um, went and took some additional jobs in between because um, we were delayed. So he started in February, February 1st. The plan is still to be completed. By the end of this fiscal year, we have a, a bunch of encumbered money that we were unable to spend because of the delay. So that, you know, it's not critical that it gets spent by the end of the fiscal year, but from a bookkeeping perspective, it should be a nightmare to keep going. And so we're trying to really expedite that. I don't think it's going to be the problem. We met today to sort of finalize what we're looking at in terms of sizing of things and locations of things. And so and then added some additional air units in order to circulate better downstairs, one additional unit. So my hope is that it's going to stay within the currently allotted funds. Um, we did have one positive surprise just a few days ago, right last week, I guess, where the, this is how this project evolves, which is we, we had planned on using carpet on that entire side. It turns out that the floors are in great repairable condition on that entire side with a tin ceiling run. So uh, I had about $3,700 left from a previous article. And so I, I'm going to try this. Danny's saying between six and eight to get it done. I'm going to try to fit it in and we'll see. But if not, I've already emailed Historic about that, about 
you know, I assume this is a thing we want to prioritize if possible. I think that's a low incredible. So historic has been has been involved in this process where you've been meeting with them. Talking. So we met a couple. We met in February specifically about the Elko, but we did a walkthrough of the space over there. Um, and they've been on the emails about expediting, like getting the cosmetic improvements to the end office expedited so we can get it back in use if need be the, the floors are you refurbishing original hardwood yeah and so and you can go down there now and actually see them so so we still have to do one more coat on the hallways but now like we'll be able to incorporate the two it's, it's gonna let me do it. it's gonna flow with that that conference room area and it's, it's the same boards they wouldn't when you, when you pull it up i can't get some, uh, some uh, the data wiring and, and moving some of that and we kicked it up. I said, why are we putting carpet in here? And he started yeah. to pull it. He said, well, then he started to pull it up more. And it was it got better as we pulled. So it was, you know. It, right. It, it really it is like every time a layer comes down, then we can basically see what's there or not there. Right? And it's been really interesting, even what's in the walls in terms of like when it was built, how it was built, what got done, and then making a determination about is, do we touch this at all? Right and go around. And that's a question I have. When you say, "How do we make the determination?" Right. How do we make any determinations as you discover things as you go? So typically, like that's happened with the floors. So Danny, so that every piece of this is like we have a general concept about what we want to do in the area, right? If the original goal is create a conference room space, right? Great, starts there. So what does that look like in determination of size? But it really depends which walls of these could move or not move, right? Then it that goes from- well, Who's involved in the decision-making process? So sort of not even like, I don't, I think, I think honestly, probably we need to make the decisions. And so I don't think it's a broad decision-making. Well, if you can just interject that there was a discussion a couple of years ago about, about the concept, but the issue was, you don't know ex what, what the details are gonna be until you get it opened up. And then of course we had, we, we were stalled for what, about six months? Because you, that's my point exactly. Right. Now that we're doing it again, we right. discover something new. I'd say, you know, we know the historic commission. Yeah, they've been meeting with Kim, and Kim has been going along with the plan that was laid out, but that's where we're having this discussion right now. Right. So I guess my point is yeah. do we need to sort of formalize a little bit the communication or make sure that at, at a very minimum, nobody says, I didn't know, right? I want to just avoid that dynamic. If it, I'm not saying it's happening, I'm just saying, right. let's get the right people there to say, Touch the stone and say, oh, yeah, look, preserve the wood floors. I mean, if Kathy's listening, she's right. Yeah, good. Originals being saved, right? But right. we just want to make sure that all the, they're not decision makers, but there's people we should always communicate to, stakeholders, stakeholders right? right? I just want to make sure the right people are here. I would 100% say that's 100% happening right now. Right. It's exactly it has been. just laid out. That's happening right now. Historic was called. Kim's going to meet with her, go over the floors. There's no decision that's been made yet 100%. There's been discussion about we want to keep them. There's been discussion about what the cost is going to be. Kim's working on that angle. There's no change down there right now whatsoever, yeah. except that the hardwood was found under that carpet as it was progressed, and exactly everything that you just laid out mm -hmm. is in progress. Right. Just well, It was just said. It was a concept a few years ago, and it's just been walking around, and they've been involved, as far as I know, in, in every step along the way and there really hasn't been a lot except it's was torn apart right and well i think you know, what mike is trying to say is he wants to know who is getting final say in the design not final say i don't know who's getting communicated to because i'll go to a meeting and i hear i don't know what's going on so as much as it's being said i want to make sure everybody's got it documented so we can say no you do know what's going on we had a meeting on state and said yeah remember we talked about the hard floor that's all Right. So avoid noise because I think this is really good work and I want to see it completed quickly and not have people say, well, did this happen or did that happen? I, you, Kim, you know, people say, I don't know. And I've been in meetings that I've seen people in listening who say, I don't know. And I'm like, well, let's just make sure we over communicate is my point. Right. Well, I just want to say, I think at this point, since we've been in it for about a year and a half and the every time we've reached out to have a meeting we've had a meeting every time someone has asked for a specific piece of information they've gotten a piece of information or a document that was existed or a plan that was existed right every time 
a decision gets made around who, like at least for this second part, right? Are we going to continue with the same vendor and have the same quality of work? We've had those meetings, had those conversations, right? Are we going to prioritize the historic components that we find? Absolutely, we've done that all the way through, right? So there haven't been any new significant changes besides post alcove whatever window situation down there, right? Well, nothing you is, could just dismiss that. So right. Nothing is back. nothing has changed since then, um, besides timetable. Right. And it's I understand the frustration around on both sides about how do we not know exactly what this is going to look like? Because we really don't know. Like, and so we have a general idea, but I'm trusting Danny when he's taking down a wall, like he just took down this one side of the wall on the opposite side of my office to take a look at that, to look at the there, you know, there's some weird poles down there that can't move at all. Right. Those are eyesores in a weird sort of way. So like you have to take into consideration, like, so do we move the wall to that spot to move a door closer? Like what makes the most sense in this space? Right. If the goal is preservation of the ceiling and it's creation of the conference room, you know, consider every little piece of that as we go. And you know, just like with my office downstairs, you know, there's a question about does that wall move? It seems like a waste. We already built the wall. Like if there's a hole and if we move the wall and the ceiling has to get done and cost is obviously a big piece here, right? Because this budget is not large. It's been small. And so, you know, we're at the final, we're at the final stretch now and we are making choices now. I'm making choices, or when these guys come in to do wiring, we're making choices more based upon cost now than I was, let's say, when we first started, right? So, you know, floors are a priority, right? For sure. But moving the wall entirely, not as much anymore, right? Like, so that if it's, if there's no historic value to it, or it doesn't add any specific component that's necessary, we think about that, right? Like, does, do we need a second door in this conference room? It's a nice to have. Do we have to have it? Probably not. Aesthetically, does it make sense? Yes, or no, right? Just like the choices down at the end, in the end room. Should we strip that paneling off the wall, expose what's under there, it's horsehair plaster on one side, it's like general plaster on the other side? No, we can just paint it, paint the ceiling, change the tiles out, change the carpet out, change that door out, it basically looks like the rest of the building without taking it down to bare bones. But like when we started this, the general plan was always get a conference room, clean up these offices, get the floors refinished, have a more general pleasant experience okay, when you go into the town hall, right? And so to bring everybody else along and they're they're saying, oh, cool, right? Good. And there's no That's Noise. I, don't, I hate that's noise. what it's, well, I think there's going to be noise. Yes. I'm, no matter. We what. just need to do everything we and it sounds like we are humanly possible to avoid noise and include people yeah. in, and, in this process. Right. So if something goes left instead of right, say, hey, especially if you work in this building, I think they they're not decision makers, but folks work in the building would probably want to know. Right. And, and, right. And it has been, but while we're discussing this, there's another piece to this, which is with the state right. and environmental issues. And I know Joyce, she would come along. So I think, is it tomorrow? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. So well, please brief the board on that. Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure how this transcribed, but uh, I think that one of the, the employees was uh, concerned. Well, it doesn't really matter how it's just. Right concerned about the air quality and um we ended up talking to this fellow who was in charge of this that his name is mike feeney uh and so he's coming tomorrow to uh evaluate the area down there um, and see what the recommendations are required actually so I'm going to meet with them and anybody else. That is he going to do? He's going to do the main floor too, right? Is he going to? Uh, so oh. he's coming up. Right. So we did do was we did actually do a test in 2014, and they did monitor levels in 2014. So I'm really interested. Monitor to levels of what? I, all different sorts. There's a report that I forwarded you. They monitored oral. I didn't get it. Yeah, it was in, e in well, email. it was email. Okay. So we did a study one time before the basin was remodeled. And they actually did 
all the floors, this floor, the main floor, and the bottom floor, and then registered all different sorts of levels. And so that's why I was saying if you really, that was before we did renovations, especially in the right. basement. So I really am curious in getting as many data points as we can in the different, because some of the most problematic areas in the building are directly involved the boiler room, which is in that, <laughs> in that, that corner over there. And that, I mean, as bad as any of the enclosed windowless rooms downstairs. So like, I think you do anything. Yeah. More. So it, if if we can do all of the floors, I'd love to have that data. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that he will. I mean, he seems to be. I mean, um, the day that I talked to him, I I called him at four past nine. Yeah. In the morning, and I finally was able to hang up at eleven twenty-five. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, then I'm just saying. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, that would be like just I would love to. I mean, I mean, part of it is just selfishly because I did. That's part of the reason that I redid the basement or was so pressed to do it because of the conditions down there. Not that there was anything hazardous that was reported. Let's just be clear in that study. Right. But like it just was so unappealing and just. Right. Not great. And so I really just want to see that it actually had a benefit beyond just cosmetic. Yeah. That would really make me feel feel good. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think while he's here, it makes sense to get as much yeah. as possible. I right. guess the only because he's he he believe me. <laughs> so, thorough. It sounds like he's thorough. Yeah. yeah. Can you send that again? Yeah. I'm not seeing it here. Sure. It's, it's in sure. that email that I sent it. It should be attached to the email that I sure. when I yeah. Found just general case. question. Do you think there'd be any impact for volatile organics? Because it's like you know, there's big painting and stuff going on downstairs. I think that would impact any levels that we should be. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Uh, you know, but the the, the things that you know that if Massachusetts and this area, of Massachusetts, is is has a lot of radon. Mm -hmm. So that that's problematic. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. Did they test for radon back in the day? They did, and so I'll just I'll so. I'll just, it, you guys are all CC'd on this, but I'll just do it. I'll send it all again. Sure. Um, uh, sure. If it doesn't stay still attached, but yeah, they did. I mean, the, the numbers that were, we had two complaints, carbon monoxide was of concern and then radon was another uh -huh. concern, right. particularly, you know, but we did put in, that's what I said, we, we put mini splits in and we did sort of, you may remember, you may all, some of you may remember, but like, in the basement before there was like a weird vent that went inside outside and that was the, and it was blocked with that shelf that was in the back of the building with all that so a lot of the pictures in this report are actually of like clutter and dust and mold and like looking at it was like a trip down memory lane like it's amazing how it's transformed but that's I, where the board of health office yeah, was downstairs well missy missy back in the day but she had a window so her, the numbers in her office weren't as bad okay. but over it where the building department was in that back section was bad in the planning board room which is the one now also wasn't great but all they had then was that one vent that was like kind of went outside into the rocks so yeah right so they so we put system in there but i don't i'm curious i don't think station. it's enough i mean really i think it right so, so. I mean, he, he he seems to be very thorough that uh he was actually driving to agawam uh that morning that i was talking to him so i think i i, I was his distraction <laughs> <laughs> I'm about the right amount of time. <laughs> Honest to God, I, I, I couldn't even. That's not the end of the earth, but I you could see it. You know, I was like, yeah. I couldn't even move because I was talking to him. Anyway. But so Joyce, just FYI, it's in your Menden one, not your Gmail. So okay. maybe that's why you didn't see it. When I replied, I, I always try to use the Menden email addresses right. because. Yeah, I'll show so it just again. I'm sending it again right now. Oh, good. So okay. you can take a look at it, but that you'll have it for you'll see where they measured last time. All right. I noticed like the assessors were here. And I wasn't sure if they joined us for this conversation, but I know that Susan had an email or request to get Gene's door changed. Is that part of this or is that so done? We, we kind of responded to the door change uh, like over a, a month ago about that. Danny had just placed it aside on that. He had just started working that day, so he's on his list of the things. Um, 
that he has to do so that he I think they emailed on the 31st and he was starting on the first. Yeah, I think she asked, can, can we make that a priority? Right. And since then, so um, I, I also said in an email that I sent to all of you. So we've offered many, many alternative locations for work. Our offices, this location, we have plenty of space now. Right. Uh, but in addition, I've asked Danny to expedite this office that's on this main floor. I mean, I know we're in construction, but so he's committed to having it done and ready to use by the St. Patrick's Day, basically. So within two weeks. So, so in if the, they were just asking for a door to be done, hinges and added. Right. Well, the it, the issue is when once this about what's going on with the what air quality in that on the on the bottom floor, and there's a office that could be ready in this floor. I, I think all of it. We'll find out tomorrow. But just as long as they're aware of what the current thinking is, right? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure we're all on that okay. email about the door. I responded directly to her about that. And then and then when we were had the, talking about air quality, also alternative locations. Yeah, no, the air, no one air has quality, to work in a I see. Yeah. I never saw I was on the original email asking I'll about the door. Right I don't now. think I was on the response. Okay. Okay. So I'll check right. Lonnie, you had a no, okay. Anything else on, on the update? The campus uh, is going great, obviously. Um, so everything's really on schedule over there. And the, the next phase, we'll have a meeting next week. But the um, this section over here is supposed to be an ADA walkway. So we're going to be working with CPC very soon, or Dan is going to be working to make sure that the items that we, we an article was approved for $56,000 specifically related to the walkway. And believe me, we're going to need every dollar. So we want to make sure that things that are qualified, uh, as these bills come in, it gets applied to the correct accounts. But I mean, that's going great. And I have, to, I just want to say, even though it's early, UEL has been incredible to work with. They are, and I, we've worked with other contract firms in the past. Maybe it was the scope of the project, but they have been awesome, really. So I'm just it looked awesome. Yeah, I mean, really, really easy to work, super responsive, very flexible, really accommodating to requests. And I just, it, it's great. been it's been great. Any word on the well or the, anything from the water department about the treatment system? So I did get it right. So I got a quote the other day from Dan on a filtration system um, that was like 10-6, I believe. Uh, and so I was that I was just looking at the, the numbers just yesterday. That's why I knew that I went over here. I needed to start applying over here. I think we'll be able to fit that within the budget, within the within the campus budget. Right. So right. may I ask you what what are they finding in the water? Oh, manganese. manganese and, and, I, and there's also some PFAS. Some PFAS. Right. right. That's what. Right. It, yeah. So that is, I mean, manganese fine. With the world, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have a filter in my house, and uh, we went down 400 feet, and then manganese and I, you know, right. it's like everybody has it, but it does need to be filtered, and it, you know, it's 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 important to uh, check it too. Everybody, you know, like I'd like to put out like a little thing sometimes. Everybody, check your get your water tested. You know, uh, make sure that everything you're getting everything that you need because. Yeah. But right, that's another. Day. I mean, I was happy to see that it was ten thousand dollars. I hope that's the only one. I'm glad. So I'm saying like that right. seems manageable. It seems yeah. That, it seems like. I don't think I. It's a lot better than a back at the corner of my house. Was yours that much? No. 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 So there, but well, I also didn't have PFAS. I don't think so. Maybe the PFAS is the additional cost. Right. Uh, I bet you would right now. No, I, I just but, put it in. But every, well, everywhere would right now. This is something that this is something that's yeah, changed. Literally, I'm told. Uh, so Cahill was saying within six months that well, it just. How long ago? Six months. Oh yeah, no, I've been there long. Yeah. Year. Yeah. There's a private well legislation going through right now as well. From the way Yeah. Yeah. Big things. All right, so. So we got we got that now. As far as the uh, warrant article discussion, the the uh, warrant doesn't close for two weeks, so I'm just going to move that because that's you know we can discuss it after that date, but we can discuss it at the next meeting. Okay. Um, I know there were two two issues. One of them is to increase the size of the uh, 
of the ZBA, another one about uh, funding for the next phase of the senior center. We'll discuss that. We have time to do that. We'll talk about that in two weeks. So um, I'm looking for uh, motions. Did, did everybody get a chance to look at January 4th and February 1st? I move to, oh, sorry. Move to approve the meeting minutes of January 4th and February 1st, 2024. I was second. Is that, oh, okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Next meeting uh, will be the 15th. Well, before you sit, we go. I just want to point out that the 15th, because we've had some movement in the budget requirements, be a big one. we have a lot of. I mean, I don't think it'll be super lengthy. I mean, MRSDA will be here, so that will take up some time. The Board of Health will be here, and I know they want to talk about some things. The Council of Aging will be here. The library will be here. These are all typically boards that want to do presentations of their own. Well, do we? Add and then highway, but I mean, I've done most of, I've yeah. done the highway budget, so I can speak to that at any point. But we might want to think about potentially here have adding time for the meeting to start talking about the warrant because we're getting close to the April sort of deadline. Right. And they don't want us to get into a situation. Adam, 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 yeah. Next week. Or, like, Next week. Yeah. or like start earlier or just plan for a really long meeting. Uh, because well, everybody available yeah, on the 8th this week? I'm not available on the 8th. What about, the meeting? Well, what about the meeting after though? Right, because we, do the, we want to. Oh, we could double up because the week after. Technically, the, the articles can come in until, what, the 17th, right? And we want to do at least two passes of those articles, right? So I'm just telling you. Right. Like, hopefully. At we have a little bit of time now because oh, we're doing, doing the mailer. Right. Oh, so yeah, we've got right. like another week or two. Yeah, that, that's still work, still right. either, yeah. like it's, it's a quicker turnaround. It's right in there that we'll have to meet, and then they'll be doing the public hearing for the budget. I guess around the twelfth, but based upon this, these numbers today, I think, I mean, we're I negative. Yeah, we're especially and lengthier meetings, unfortunately. Yeah, the twenty second. If we do the extra meeting on the twenty second, and we're actually able to accommodate everything in that, if there's. Or do we have other schedule? What I'm just saying is, right now we're on schedule with the board of health meeting. Right. Yeah. And it, yeah, we, we do that. Then kind of right. We can reset from there. It just helps meet at ten of those. Right. Because I yeah. think we were going to meet the fifth. It would have been April fifth and April nineteenth, and then the public hearing and the budget theoretically would be the twelfth. Usually, right in the middle of the month, where we have a joint meeting just for that. Yeah. Um, I. I don't know what the school's calendar is about their certifying their budget, though. You know, when their final number would be. I think they're, um, they went to the 23rd. They need that. Their budget hearing is like the 23rd of March. Right. So, I mean, based on these numbers today and just the minimal local contribution contribution number for MRSDA, I mean, we're negative $600,000. So, and that's without whatever their budget requests right. are for their budget. So, that's beyond a level of between BVT, Norfolk Aggie, and MRSTA, that's $800,000 of an increase. So it, I don't know how much room there really is there, and I don't want to take it all out on MRSTA, right? So we need to actually have some conversations around that. So, it, so I mean, to that point, I was saying it probably makes sense to sort of summarize now where we are in terms of the next meeting, say, where are all the, the, the increases found? Whether it be school um, departments, you see where the what the hole is, where it's coming from, because we need to start thinking about what are we going to do about that, right? So it's good to get the updates, but now I think it's sort of we're at a point where we get to start to close on the budget and figure out how do we finance or do we not finance some of these things. And, well, so, so there is a tab right in the budget yes. thing that updates as these things get updated, right? I have a budget drivers tab basically yeah. that breaks them out. Um, last week, or maybe it was this week, I can't remember. I actually went in and started separating even out where the contractual salary increases come from because people do ask that. How much is police and how much is town hall and how much is I, like our drivers are things that we are committed to right in contract. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else is optional. I mean, I can tell you, I don't have $200,000 to find in this budget or 300 to cut. I mean, we don't without cutting services. I know that as a fact. So um, 
we can cut everything that was asked for a request, which was $143,000. It's not going to get us anywhere near any of that. You're talking about going back and making decisions like, can we power up and change retiree benefits like we've been talking about and save 60 grand? Can we take, um, postpone the capital replacement costs in the public works for a year because we're changing the department and maybe we won't need it next year. Like that's what we're talking about, right? All the money that we put aside that I knew would eventually get cut for these reorganizations and reclassifications, 45,000, that will be gone. It won't be there to do, right? Unless we're talking about an operational override, which it seems crazy, but that's an easy about reorganizing the town operation that we've talked about that actually it's a type of change that one would say might require an override because we're investing you know what i mean it's not just because it's mismanaged right so, uh, maybe you're all involved in work right so to that point you do have a meeting tomorrow just so you know just a catch up meeting with both the uh town hall and the highway union just I've given them copies of both of the documents, just so if they have any questions about, this is the scope of the study, and here's the schedule, and this is the DLS. There's no action planned around any of this. This is just, if you want to ask any questions about what's happening and where we're at in terms of how soon, or like just to get some of those fears sort of squashed, right? A little. So um, I'll let you know if anything comes out of it. So if I have any questions on that tab, I'd just send you an email. Yeah, I mean, and if you think of something else that would be helpful to pull out in a way that, I mean, our, I always feel like our stuff is pretty straightforward, right? So I, I know the places that we could, you know, I know your options. Do you want to use money from stabilizations to float a year? I don't know. Do you want me to not fund 100% of the help? I mean, I know where every dollar is, right? To get to where we need to get to all the time. What I don't like to do is put together a hypothetical cut list of services until we have a real number for parcel, right? Like that's not, a, I don't want to go down that route because people get very nervous. I really don't like that that list doesn't become public until we get to an override, right? Like, yeah, that's, no, that's I don't think anyone's suggesting that, but I think variable versus contractual, things like that, that's all the stuff we need to understand. And it's there, I'll, yeah. I'll pull it out. Right, everything that's a driver for us, everything that's elicited as a driver is a contractual. So do we right. wanna do we wanna schedule a meeting for, do we have the time to schedule a meeting for next week or is it it's not gonna I, so I would we need to focus on the warrant, right? We're gonna need to finish up these budgets. We need to hear from MERSDA. We need data before we, the next thing anyway. So that's what all I'm saying is I think you should be thinking between the 15th and somewhere early in April that we okay. might need to add a meeting here to basically right. finalize or catch up on the warrant and do an extra budget meeting, right? And then there won't be anything for us to do until we have direction from town meeting about the budget, right? So there'll be a window there. So all right, we'll so we'll keep the meeting in May. We keep the meeting in two weeks and we'll look at adding a meeting after that. Right. All right. Well, you're definitely going to have to have a second one to review the articles. Yeah, sure. Right. right. I'm available if something changes the next week. All right. All right. Motion to adjourn. So move. Okay. Okay. All right, everybody. All those in favor. Thank you. Have a good night. Everybody. Thank you.